2023. I am joined by my colleagues, Council Members Rodriguez, Council Member Harris Dawson, Council Member Lee. Um, can you please call the roll? Certainly, Madam Chair. Council Member Aman? Here. Council Member Blumenfield? Oh, Council I didn't see Member you there. Hi. Council Member Harris Dawson? Council Member Rodriguez? Here. Council Member Lee? Present. Five members in the courtroom, Madam Chair. Fabulous. So today we have 10 items to consider. I'm going to go through the items quickly, and I wanted to note for the public that two of these items will need to be continued for two different reasons. Um, item one is a communication from the mayor regarding the reappointment of Dr. Melissa Chinchilla to the Lhasa Commission for the term ending June 30th, 2026. Uh, Dr. Chinchilla is here, and she's already been before this committee when she was first appointed, but I welcome you back. Item two is a communication from the mayor regarding uh, the appointment of Mr. Christopher Zamore to the House LA Citizens Oversight Committee, but the appointee has actually withdrawn himself from consideration. So I'm not sure exactly how we proceed on that. Note and file, okay, great. Item three is a motion regarding the Community Investment and Families Department and LASA to report on recommendations to enhance city programming uh, serving female identifying individuals um, who are experiencing homelessness and people who are survivors of intimate partner violence. Um, this is based on the findings of the 2022 LA County Women's Need Assessment. Item four, and that's just a motion. Item four is a report from the Board of Recreation and Park Commissioners regarding authorizing the Department of Recreation and Parks to execute agreements for the Pueblo del Sol development in CD14. Item five is reports from the Bureau of Engineering and the CAO about an interim housing facility at 2377 Midvale Avenue in CD5. Item six is a communication from the mayor regarding the Homeless Emergency Action Plan in response to the updated emergency declaration. Um, but the council must consider the renewal of this emergency declaration by November 4th. And as a result, this item is going to be continued to the committee's October 18th meeting. So I just wanted to flag that for members of the committee and members of the public who are here. And item seven is actually an error on the part of our own team, and I apologize for that. Um, this is a, uh, regarding the proposed design of the opioid and tobacco settlement funds, and we actually misscheduled this. Uh, the mayor's office is not available, but will be available during our next meeting to be able to discuss this. So our sincere apologies. Um, item eight is a report from the Prop HHH Administrative Oversight Committee regarding amendments to the fiscal year uh, 21 project expenditure plan. And item nine is a CAO report creating a standardized request for proposals and or other process for privately owned parcels to be considered for acquisition or development as interim housing sites along with potential funding options for this process. This was continued from Friday's meeting. Um, and item 10 is a verbal update from HACLA regarding progress on the emergency housing voucher lease up process which we've been monitoring in the committee um, for quite some time now. So at this time, I'm gonna take public comment, and I just wanna make sure we have an interpreter available for commenters if they require it. Great. Um, and uh, we have Geetha O'Neill from the city attorney's office who is going to provide some guidance to the public before they uh, give us some comment. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. To the members of the public, when it's your turn to speak, please state your name and which of the agenda items you would like to speak on. You will have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more items. In addition, those who would like to address the committee with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum of up to three minutes per person for all agenda items, including general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on an agenda item, I will give you a warning. If you do not immediately clearly get back on topic, or if you again strike off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time, and we will move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Great. And we have a large number of public commenters who are here. Most of them are speaking on one item, so they'll only take up one minute. Um, but I'm going to keep public comment to a total of an hour today, so we'll have until 3.45 to hear public comment, and then uh, we will move on to discussion of the item. So I just wanted to share that in advance, and we'll start um, start public comment with. Where's the list? Okay, 
we'll start with Galina Atencio, Allison Schallert, and Toby Murez, Murezhnu. And if you want to start coming over here, and I'll call two more names so that we can get a line going. Andrew Kahn and Damian Wagner. And uh, your name and the items you're speaking on? Um, my name's Toby Morishano. I'm speaking Morishano. on item okay. number yes. five. Okay, great. You have one minute. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name's Toby Morishano. I am a homeowner and the father of two small kids. I live in Pico and Overland, close to the proposed Midvale site. I am strongly in support of it. Um, uh, earlier this year, I made friends with a person who was experiencing homelessness on Pico. Uh, to my surprise, he was not a criminal. He was not a drug user, he didn't drink, he was just a regular guy from LA who wanted housing. And then about a month later, it rained for three days and he died of pneumonia. This would have saved his life. I think that should trump other concerns. I also don't think that having people, even though I sympathize with his situation, in living in the alcoves of businesses is good for businesses, or that it makes people in the neighborhood feel safe. So for that reason, I strongly support this project. If there is another site that's also good, that's great. We have 25,000 beds in LA for about 75,000 homeless people, and we need a lot more housing quickly, and every politician has promised it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Morshanu. Next speaker. Hi, Allison Schallert. How are you? Thank you for your time. Thanks what for... item are you speaking on? Oh, sorry, item number five. Great, you have one minute. Please, um, this is a state of emergency. We need all hands on deck. We need as many beds as possible. I don't think that, uh, um, I, I really just think that NIMBYism is a gross thing of the past, and we just need to move forward and provide beds and a way um, for people to survive on the um, in Los Angeles. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Schallert. Next speaker. Hello, my name is Galina Atencio. I'm immediate uh, item five on the agenda that I'm addressing. You have um, one minute. Uh, thank you. I'm opposed to this project. I'm an immediate member um, of the neighborhood. Uh, I also represent Century Glen stakeholders, and uh, we conducted the poll, and uh, they provided us with their majority negative feedback for this project. Uh, I believe community deserves more information about who is going to be housed in that project before it's moved forward. Um, the concern is that there are children, there are schools uh, in the immediate vicinity, and uh, since we are not, have not been informed who is going to be housed in that project, there is concern for safety for immediate members and members of that community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And you, your name was Galina? Thank you very much. Next speaker? Yeah, Andrew Kahn. Uh, Andrew. Uh, Andrew. Okay, go uh, ahead. Item five, and uh, uh, a resident of the neighborhood. Great. Never mind the lack of due process. Never mind that our councilwoman would choose to bulldoze her constituents rather than working with us to find a better solution. This is objectively a bad project. As a father of young children, I am deeply concerned that it will further undermine the already precarious Sorry, state gonna, of safety hold on, hold in on our neighborhood. Second. Sir, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask members. We're pausing your time. You're not losing your time. Members of the... No, no. We will give you back your time. Don't worry. Okay. Um, I just want to request that people who are here do not clap during or after speakers. We just need to get through as many speakers as possible. We need to be able to hear people. So I'm going to ask everyone here to be respectful. No clapping, no booing. Thank you. Can we start over, please? You can have extra 10 seconds. Go ahead. Uh, I don't remember where I left off, so just give me a second. Okay. Okay. As a father of young children, I am deeply concerned that it will further undermine the already precarious state of safety in our neighborhood, as we've seen with other projects like this, where word spreads fast, more homeless show up, and loitering leads to camping and to increased violence. I have no reason to trust that this council can keep my family safe. We have had to call the police a number of times over the past three years due to troubling run-ins with the homeless. One of the times the LAPD did show up, after my wife was attacked in her car by a homeless man with a rock, they told us that the best thing to do to protect ourselves was to get a gun and a guard dog. The LAPD told us to get a gun. I don't know about you all, that's not the kind of environment in which I wish to raise my family. So why would you vote to experiment with the safety and freedom of young kids and parents with this type of project? It doesn't make sense. Please don't do this to us. Thank you very much. 
Um, and as our next speaker comes up, I'm going to call a few other names. Roger Witherington, Vaughn Mayer, and Meg Sullivan, and Math, Math uh, Utsunomia. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Damien Wagner. And what um, item are you speaking on? I am with uh, uh, the homeless issue. I, I, um, you have one minute. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Damien Wagner. I'm with uh, uh, D DLANC. Um, we've relaunched the Urban Needs Committee, and I'm just looking forward to working with you. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Damien. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Vaughn Meyer, and Vaughn. I live. I'm speaking on item five. Okay. I live in district in District Five, and I support the Midvale Interim Housing Project because one, it would be the only interim housing in the district, and we need to do our part. Enough of NIMBYism. Two, other interim housing projects have been built in similar neighborhoods and have not had any uptick of crime or nuisances. And I'm confident that with this plan as outlined, the same will happen here. Three, District 5 needs to do our part in helping make LA more livable for everyone. Overtime funding has been allotted for LAPD for shortened response times. The neighborhood will be safer than it is now. There will be 1, 000, a 1,000 foot no camping zone around the site with enforcement. There are already tents in that parking lot. They will no longer be there. So this is a, it will be a great improvement to our neighborhood and we need to do our part. Thank you. Next speaker, uh, excuse me, I'm going to have to ask you to please be quiet. Thank you. Next speaker. Go ahead. What item are you speaking on? Uh, item five. Item five, you have one minute, sir. And tell okay. me your name. My name is uh, Roger Witherington. Roger, okay, great. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I also live on uh, Midvale Avenue. Uh, this is not only about housing, it is also about services. So-called wraparound. What does wraparound mean to you? It is advertised as being mental health, help with, with drug addiction, we'll provide all your food, and so on and so forth. And safety, 24 seven. I have not seen anywhere an estimate of what that cost is going to be and, and, or as part of the budget. But I'll tell you right now that trying to do that for 33 people in a very tight place is just not practical. It is wraparound light. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, and we'll call a few more names. Arnold Sachs, Aaron Wilson, Kay Hartman, and Louis Abramson. My name is Meg Sullivan. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak on item five. You have one minute. I live in Rancho Park, and I'm here to implore you please not to put housing of any type on the Midvale or any city lots parallel to Pico through Rancho Park. These lots are absolutely essential for the revitalization of the corridor, which has been in free fall since the closure of most of the West Side Pavilion in 2019 and the closure of the rest of it during the pandemic. Losing this parking will doom any chances of revitalizing the walkable character of our neighborhood. While we all walk to Pico businesses, these businesses can't survive with neighborhood patronage alone. They also need to attract customers from elsewhere. These customers need parking. And those options have always been inadequate in this area, which is the heartbeat of our, res our commercial area. I get that revitalizing our neighborhood is beyond the purview of this body, thank, but please Thank you don't. very much. Your time is up. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Louis Abramson. I'm here to speak on item five. You have one minute. Um, it was the privilege of my life last year to run to represent this part of the world uh, in our state assembly. And it was the privilege of my life because in so doing, I got to talk to thousands of people uh, across this community and, the rest, and many others in Los Angeles. And what was remarkable was that despite the imaginary lines that our system, our bureaucracy, our geography puts in place in homelessness to separate us, what was remarkable was how united these thousands of people were in confronting the homelessness crisis that faces us now. They have known and have been saying this is an all-hands-on-deck emergency for years. Our government has now thankfully finally caught up and transforming a city-owned property into innovative modular housing is exactly the type of action that meeting this moment requires. So 
I would just, I'm just here to say that as we are united in our recognition now uh, of the magnitude of the emergency we're facing, let us be united in taking the step to end it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next speaker, and we've called Matt Utso Utsonomia, Arnold Sachs, Aaron Wilson, and Kay Hartman. Kay Hartman. And what item are you speaking on? Hi, so uh, number five. Okay, you my have one name, minute. My name is Kay Hartman. I'm president of the Palms Neighborhood Council, speaking for myself. Change is hard. I've lived in Palms, and things are changing so fast that we struggle to understand it. Palms, the Palms I moved into in 1983 is not the Palms of today and definitely not the Palms of tomorrow. Still, the changes will benefit the city as a whole. In Palms, we are experiencing an incredible increase in density. I don't think any other community in CD5 has, going, has anything going on like what we're experiencing. But it is what is happening and we are finding our way to live with it, although gentrification is forcing some people out. The density we take eases pressure on other CD5 communities. We are not all doing an equal share to create affordable housing. I don't live very far from Pico, I can walk to it. I sometimes park in the city lot under discussion. Interim housing is needed. This one project by itself won't make much of a difference, but many such projects might. I think it should be built. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. And I'm going to call two more names. Jesse Harris and Margaret Harrington. Your name and item you speak on. My name is Erin Wilson, and I'm here for item five. You have one minute. Um, I live in the neighborhood, and the walkability of this neighborhood is what brought us to the neighborhood. I have two small children. We've lived there for almost six years, and I've spent my time walking up and down these streets with my children in their strollers, and now by their hand, going to these um, establishments that are all still struggling from COVID. And I stand here and urge you not to do this. If we do this, the people in our neighborhood will not feel comfortable coming out and walking. The people who do still want to come will have nowhere to park. It is detrimental to the businesses. It's detrimental to the families that live there and let their kids grow up there. I have a friend who could not be here today. She has two, four, four young, young children, two of which are uh, preteens, and they ride their bikes together by themselves without an adult on these streets. They go to Taekwondo by themselves. They go to swimming lessons at Rancho Park by themselves on their bike. They run small errands for their mom who can stay home. She's a homeschooler with her two younger kids. If they aren't safe to go to these things by themselves, she will have to leave and take them. They'll go to less things. Her other kids will have less to do. Thank this you. This isn't. Thank you very much. Your time is up. We appreciate your testimony. Next speaker. <coughs> Mr. Thank Sachs, what items are you speaking on today? Oh, I was going to speak on the whole agenda, actually, but probably not get through all of them. But um, and public so comment. You, you have two minutes for the items. One minute. Well, I'm going to. Okay, one minute for public comment. Uh, well, what should I do first, the agenda? Yeah, the items, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, again, as I pointed out earlier, the county has a, a guidebook that includes LASA, Los Angeles Housing's, um, I don't know what the S, Services Authority. City and the county have been working together since 1983. That's 30 years. That's almost 40 years. Why is nobody from the county here to discuss LASA? You have city employees here for LASA. You have city employees you're going to appoint to the board. But there's nobody here from the county. They're collaborative together, city and the county working together. So if you're working together for the same, same goal, whatever that goal is supposed to be, where are the county employees? Where are the county, where are the county supervisors? to discuss this with the board, with the city council members. How can you make decisions for the county when the county is not making decisions for the city? They just came up with a 44, they have a $48 billion budget. That's $4 billion a month. What's the budget for the city? 15 billion, 18 billion? With the, with the new federal adjustments coming in because the federal government starts their calendar year in October? So that's almost $62 billion. And you have a homelessness crisis? When did it become homelessness? When the hell did it become homelessness? When did you add the nests on to homeless? It was always homeless. 
You had multiple plans. James, Con James Hahn had a multi homeless plan. There was the Affordable Care Act that had a homeless plan. They signed up 15,000 people on Skid Row. What the fuck happened to that plan? It was the most progressive plan ever. It would have provided health care to ho homeless people, low-income people. He said no to his own plan. How can you allow somebody to make a plan up that, and say no? Okay. I can keep going on public comment on the One. same thing. Go ahead. Go ahead. Barack Obama, affordable health care. That was a cutting edge affordable health care plan for low income people. All you needed to do was get a card. The guy said no. He said, fuck you, oh, Barack. Barack, yep. I don't need to get you. I just need that money. Mr. So Sachs, you've got to be talking about the items before this. I'm talking the, about homeless plans, madam, okay. ma'am. Okay. I'm talking about homeless plans. Okay. There was 15,000 people in, in this city and 15,000 people in New York City. It was a countrywide, it was a countrywide law. It was an act that was signed into law for the whole country, not just for this one county not just for Mark Ridley Thomas to use and abuse, which is exactly what he did. And everybody let him. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, and we have Matt Utsunomia, Jesse Harris, Vita Lucia, Nikki Minor, Marina Rodriguez. Uh, I am Matt Utsunomia, and I'm here to speak on item number five. You have one minute. All of us in this room, every day, we have, to, we have to witness the destitution and poverty in this city, an unaffordable housing crisis that has driven so many out of their homes. Not every homeless person is a drug-riddled addict. Many of them are just working-class families that need support. We have to do something about this crisis, and actions like interim housing are one part of the solution. Everyone agrees that we need to take action. Everyone finds excuses, though, to reflect and defer. We need housing, just not in our neighborhood. How else do you propose to solve this crisis? Continuously, endlessly sweeping people from one neighborhood to the next? Consolidate all of the poorest people in the downtown, further leading to ghettoization? Uh, it might be out of sight, out of mind for you folks, but for the rest of the city, they have to for the rest of the city, they need to bear their part of the solution as well. KDR Filofsky, please take the bold decision to make basic steps against the homelessness crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Jesse Harris, Vita Lucia, Lucia Nikki Minor, Marina Rodriguez. Shh, shh, shh. Guys, shush, shush, shush. Guys, excuse me. Excuse me. If you can't maintain quiet, we will have to ask people to leave. What's your name and the items you're speaking on? Good afternoon. I'm Margaret Harrington speaking on item five. Okay, you have one minute. Thank you. Um, we know that none of us want people to have to live on the street or in fact just to be living on the street. But the fact is for that to not happen, there have to be homes, there have to be places for them to go. As previous speakers um, have already mentioned, that we have a critical need um, in this district throughout Los Angeles for more housing options to be able to move people into safe places for them to live and to get their lives together and return to being full members of our community. Um, at the same time, neighborhoods do need and deserve to feel safe and secure. And I think the extra effort that is being invested in security, both with this facility and in the area and enforcing no camping, um, will respond to those needs. And I definitely urge that this project be supported. Thank you. OK, thank you. And can you remind me your name one more time? Margaret Harrington. Margaret Harrington. Thank you very much. Great. Next speaker. And we've called Jesse Harris, Vida Lucia, Nikki Minor, Marina Rodriguez. Go ahead. Your Hi. Name, your name and the item you're speaking on. My name is Jesse Harris. I'm speaking on item number five. Okay. You have one minute. All right. Thank you. Um, I am absolutely in support of the interim housing project uh, at Midvale and Pico. It's necessary, uh, and I think it's long overdue. Uh, as we know, um, everyone knows the city has um, a, a housing crisis, and homelessness is just the tip of the iceberg uh, of, that, of that crisis. We are all paying 
too much in rent. And that is also part of the crisis. Um, in order for us to feel safe and for our neighbors to feel safe, they have to have places to live. People cannot pick up their lives and, um, and they can't uh, excel at, at anything. Having a job, getting an education, without at first having a stable place to sleep. So that is of utmost importance. Um, and we are losing three to four people a day dying on the streets. That is not okay. I used to work at a youth shelter. A lot of these people are young people, they're kids. That is not okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Next speaker, and I'll call a few more names. Barbara Broida, Brent Kidwell, Ed Girelli, and Helen Eigenberg. Okay. Your name and the item you're speaking on. Uh, my name is Nikki Miner. I live out of the district, but I patronize Pico frequently. And you're and sorry, and you're speaking on item five, I'm assuming. Could you bring the mic a little closer to you? Okay. You have one minute. Okay. Uh, should I start all over again? You can start, yeah, go ahead. Okay, my name is Nikki Miner. I live elsewhere, but I do patronize Pico. We're not against the project, we're against the location. The location is overly expensive, and it's a poor investment because of the expenses for it. What it actually is in this location, it's a takedown, a long range plan using the homeless as pawns. Pawns in a structure on an ill-taken parking lot. DOT is complicit with their obscure, distant, dangerous substitute parking ideas nobody will use. This is a setup. Whoever is really behind all this doesn't want better, cheaper options for the homeless. They want to target and kill the Pico businesses to make new land for developers. Thank it's a red. Thank you. Your time is up, Speaker. Thank you very much. We appreciate your testimony. Next speaker, please. Council members, thank you. Vita what? Lucia speaking on item five. And tell me your name one more time. Vita Lucia. Vita Lucia, mm -hmm. thank you. I'm a compassionate person who have family members who suffered from mental illness and drug addiction. I am deeply opposed to this low barrier facility, which we were told will be for people suffering from mental illness, drug addiction, and recent incarceration. A low barrier facility does not require the admits to have a curfew, and it does not require them to have tackled their addiction before they are admitted. How are you going to treat these people if they have not detoxed? Any accredited mental health professional will tell you that this is a setup for failure. The low barrier is designed to hold no one accountable to rules in order to encourage them to seek treatment. This facility will be a magnet for drug dealers who prey upon the addicts. What happens when the addicts run out of money to pay for their drugs? This facility will create imminent danger and irreparable damage. The only people benefiting from this are those who will profit from it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lucia. I'm going to ask once again that we not applaud or boo. We're just going to keep things moving. Next speaker, your name and the item. Hello, Marina Rodriguez, item five. Okay, you have I one am minute. A resident on Midvale Avenue. I've lived there for 25 years. I have a great stake in the community, raised our child there, walked around the neighborhood, support the businesses, and I'm very much opposed to this particular project. Our local district, number five, has uh, also had some identified places that would be better locations for this sort of thing in our project. We're willing to do our part. We're not willing to ruin individual homes, to ruin ongoing businesses, and to um, change the actual nature of our neighborhood that we've worked very hard for a long time to create. And uh, like other speakers, we do believe that we all need to work together to solve the homelessness. This project is too small, too few, and I'm not a NIMBY. I've been there supporting big, uh, big multi-units, et cetera, in my neighborhood that overlook my own home. So I'm not, <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Marina. Next speaker. 
What item are you speaking on and your name, please? I am speaking on item number five. My name is Barbara Brody and I'm representing the West Side Neighborhood Council. We do not have a CIS statement before you because we were not given an opportunity to schedule this in time okay. and consider it. Okay, but you'll still have a minute for your um, May for I your also statement. make a general comment? Yes, so you'll have one minute for, your, for the item and one minute for general public comment. Go ahead. Okay, general public comment is that I would ask the members of this council to please respect the work that the neighborhood councils do and allow adequate time for us to make considered judgments so that we can do our role according to the city charter to provide the city with advice. We spend a lot of time as volunteers and sometimes it feels like no one is listening and it's very frustrating, it's disrespectful and we're trying to help. So please, when you schedule items and when reports come out, remember that we too must abide by the Brown Act and we deserve the courtesy of being able to do our job. Secondly, I'm here representing the Neighborhood Council. We were unable to take a position. We held a land use committee meeting, but the land use committee did not take a vote and referred it to our full council, although the majority of comments were critical of this location. This is a community that has a long history of doing our part. We are not NIMBYs. We have the county's welfare building and the county's social service building in our backyard. We have a Weingart Foundation permanent supportive housing project newly opened. We have two low income projects that were developed and incentivized by the community. We birthed them, we got them, we negotiated them before the city ever did anything of the sort. So we do our part and we're here to tell you this is the wrong location. It's a good project for another place and we came up with better opportunities. Council member Wesson had a similar problem. He made a mistake. He suggested something in Koreatown without consulting with the community and found it was a mistake and the community worked with him. We're asking you to continue this item in this committee, not in council, so that there is adequate time to vet the two alternatives that exist on paper and on the ground. People here advocating for the project are not familiar with those alternatives. They judge us and that's not fair. It's also not brave. It's cowardly to approve something that hasn't been properly thank, vetted. Thank you, Ms. Thank Broidy. You. Thank you. Next speaker, we have El Helen Eigenberg, Ed Girelli, Brent Kidwell. Um, let's call a couple of other, other names so we can start lining up. Um, Karna Ruskin. Larry Green, Susan Collins, Sujin Bearstock. Go ahead. Hi, Helen Eigenberg. I'm here for item number five. You have one minute. Have, I think we have an extraordinary opportunity in front of us. CD5 for a very long, long time has said no to so many things. And now we have an opportunity to build interim housing. We need it. We are in a state of emergency in our city. We all must come together and do this. And I really applaud Councilwoman Yaroslavsky for her braveness. You, uh, CD5 is used to saying no, and it's time for us to say yes. I say yes, and I will say yes to any interim housing or any housing that is built in CD5, whether it's in my backyard, whether it is next to butts up against my backyard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Your name and the item you're speaking on. My name is Ed Jurley, and I'm speaking on item five. Okay, you have one minute. My wife and I are the owners of the three commercial buildings located directly adjacent and to the west of the parking lot 707. The parking lot has been an integral part of the surrounding businesses for 30 plus years. Closing this lot will have catastrophic consequences for this business district. The influx of drug addicts and the associated dealers will discourage customers from coming to the area. Businesses will spiral to their demise. Spaces will become vacant. New tenants will no longer sign leases. Insurance companies hate empty spaces. The properties will become uninsurable. This will force property owners to board up their storefronts. In summary, I understand the city has a homeless issue that needs to be addressed. What I don't understand is why CD5 has chosen to destroy a long-standing business district in an upscale residential neighborhood. Do not approve this project and, and that will make this area the skid row of the west side. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Next speaker, I'll call uh, those names again. Brent Kidwell, Karna Ruskin, Larry Green, Susan Collins, Sujin, Sujin Bearstock. Okay, go ahead, your name and the item. Hi, my name's Brent Kidwell. 
I'm the uh, president of the Carthay Circle Neighborhood Association and I serve on the Mid-City West Neighborhood Council. And I was asked to come down here today to voice my experience in working with the CD5 office who desperately wanted to get people off the streets and into suitable housing, but their hands were tied for months. They need the resources and they need the beds. But at the same time, I want to applaud because I have my moment and they can't applaud, but good for you people because there are alternatives to something that might, might destroy a neighborhood. I've heard no more progress on what Councilperson Yaroslavsky was looking into, which was expanding the space at the VA where there have been a successful small unit housing and tents, that there is ample space there to house many more people. So please consider that as an alternative to this. Thank you. Thank you. Brent, next speaker. Karna, Larry, Susan, Sujin, I'll call two more names, Gabriel Waterman and Joseph May. What items are you speaking on? Actually, it's general comment. I, general, you have one minute, one sir. Minute, okay. Yeah. My, my name is Melrose Larry Green, and it's really an honor for me to be here in this, in this horseshoe, because goes my life at city council goes back 30 years when I ran for mayor against Richard Reardon. And I want you to know, Nithya, I've met you before. You're wonderful. I'm going through hell right now with my slumlord, David Finkelstein, and my property management firm, MCM Management. I'm a tough guy. I ran for mayor twice. I made my, worked my way through Brandeis and Cornell University. I'm suffering from high blood pressure now. My roommate is mentally and physically disabled. Where I'm a senior citizen, she can barely walk. We're up against the wall. I can totally relate to the homeless crisis because I'm on the verge of being homeless. And I'm begging you, members of the city council, you can call me, you can email me. Hugo's going to try to help me, but David Finkelstein's a slumlord, and MCM needs to have their license revoked from the Department of Real Estate. That's it. Please Thank help you. me. I'm about to be homeless. Thank you, Mr. Green. And you are in touch with CD13's representatives, right? Office is going to help me. Okay. But I used to be in your district. Yes, so. I remember that. And, I, I and we met you, on the hike, right? And I love yes. your husband, and God bless the great Tom LaBange. Yes, that's right. Nice to see you again, sir. Next speaker. Next speaker. Your name and the item you're speaking on. Hi, I'm speaking on item number five, Karna Ruskin. Okay. Um, I just want to say, the word nimbyism is kind of like a magic wand that people can try to wave around to discredit somebody, people who have a, a different opinion and who want to participate, but it's a good way to just make everyone pass judgment and to try to make what we have to say not make sense. But actually, we are here, our community is ready, we show up, we're ready to do the work. Someone from our community has worked with um, a landlord of this alternative site that is really good. It can actually house 125 people instead of 30. It, it's ready to go. It's got water. It's got electricity. And we can bring in 125 unhoused people within a few weeks. So we're ready to show up, do the work, be supportive. And as um, Ms. Brody said, we've done our, we're, we're doing our part in our neighborhood. We're not NIMBYs. We're just saying, let's be logical. Let's not waste taxpayers' money. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next speaker. Your name and the item you're speaking on. My name is Sujin Berestock, and I'll be speaking on number five. OK, you have one minute. So my husband and I have worked really hard all our lives to live in this walking community with nearby businesses. The proposed Meadville location in the interim housing will sacrifice the entire community. We are opposed to the location. Why would the city want to fundamentally change a well-functioning business district servicing an established family community and patrons from, ev from everywhere? It makes no sense that the city will, allow, will now take away a parking facility that the city specifically acquired for the business community use years ago. There are other bigger, better, less expensive options for interim housing nearby Midvale, the City 5 industrial corridors. The city does not need to betray and deteriorate this community, not in taking our essential business parking lots, and for the record, not our universally utilized parks. Thank you. Thank you, Sujin. Next speaker, your name and the item you're speaking on, and Gabriel Waterman, Joseph May, I'll call two other names, Nellie Sinha, 
Melissa Couch, and Marnie Robinow. Hi, Susan. What item are you speaking on? Hi, uh, I'm Susan Collins, and I'd like to speak on general public comment and item number five. Okay, you have one minute for each. Thank you. Um, I was in South Los Angeles over the weekend, and it looks like an absolute war zone. And it occurred while I was driving through there that our city and county agencies have failed every community in Los Angeles. The communities that needed help the most are now worse than ever. And rather than improving those communities, you've spread that level of despair to every inch in this city. You spent $20 billion to decimate an entire city. The Midvale, Pico Project, and others you're forcing into communities will to continue to decimate communities. Your legacies will be defined by your blind adherence to Housing First and the more than 6,000 deaths it causes each year in LA County alone, as well as the vacant storefronts, the stench of meth and fentanyl smoke, and having our children flee from the man with a machete or masturbating in public spaces. Withdraw from Housing First now and begin doing the real work required to start saving lives. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Your name and the item you're speaking on. Thank you. My name is Gabriel Waterman. I'm here to speak on uh, number five. Okay. Um, you have one minute. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to briefly address you um, today. Um, I live in District 5, just a few blocks between the proposed building on Prosser um, and this new proposed building on Midvale. Uh, I'm a practicing physician. I'm an internist. I've spent nearly eight years taking care of many homeless and unhoused patients at LA County Hospital. Uh, and so I do recognize the urgency and importance of this issue. Um, but while I do understand the urgency of addressing homelessness, I believe that the potential consequences of this decision on our community are significant and deeply concerning. Um, first and foremost, I want to consider the impact on our community and the impact on potential patient, uh, safety of our residents. Um, I am a father of three young girls, and I just feel like we cannot ignore the potential risks that come with establishing a homeless shelter in close proximity to our homes. We have a responsibility to, check our, to protect our children and our youth and ensure that they grow up in an environment free from unnecessary dangers um, and the inevitable drug use and occasional violence that may accompany um, the establishment of a new transitional housing unit. Um, we're also, thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Next speaker, Joseph May. Nelly Sinha, Melissa Couch, Marnie, and I'll call two other speakers, Adam Smith, and John Perez. Go ahead. What Hello. item are you speaking on? Um, I'm speaking on item number five. And your um, name? Uh, my name is Joseph May. Okay. I you have one wanted minute. to uh, voice my support for the um, transitional housing uh, development. We have a major homelessness problem and this kind of is why we have a problem every time there's a solution. There's always going to be people who are affected. I've personally lived near homeless shelters multiple times in my life and have never had issues with housed homeless people in shelters, never had issues from that. Um, now, I don't live in nearby, and so I wanted to read a comment from someone who's not able to attend because they're at work. Um, so uh, this comment from, comes from Andrea Jones, who's a mother, wife, and sustainability consultant who's lived in Rancho Park for more than 10 years. She supports the project because the neighbors deserve a, space, a safe space to sleep. It's an essential stepping stone to get people off the streets and into permanent solutions and will ultimately help create a safer neighborhood for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Hello, my name is Nelly Sinha. And, and uh, I'm speaking on item number five. Okay, you have one minute. Thank you. So I'm strongly opposed to this uh, um, project because it not only will affect all our businesses on Pico, because who will want to eat in a restaurant next to the homeless shelter? Who will want to walk on that street and go shopping there? when there will be camping all over the place. And the reason I'm saying there will be camping all over the place because uh, this homeless people probably will come to use free showers, free toilets, and I have experienced homeless camping encampment next to my house during COVID for two years, and it was terrible. We don't want the repetition of that. Just last month, my garage was broken in at night by a homeless person, and we basically do not feel safe in our neighborhood with all these uh, people around. I haven't, unfortunately, seen like a n normal person who is homeless, so uh, that's why we are opposed to that. And there are better alternatives available, so please consider them. Thank you very much, Nelly. Next speaker, 
Melissa Couch, Marnie, Adam Smith, John Perez, I'll call two more names, Ramin Gaitanchi, and Moira Kelly. Hi, thank Your you name very much. And the Melissa item? Couch and the five. Okay, you have one minute. And I have my tenant, I have a building on Pico and Veteran. We've had it in the family for over 60 years. And I wasn't notified of these meetings. So my tenant notified me last night. And it's interesting that you could get it to the businesses but not the landowners. We have a parking lot which we were slipping. Um, so they, this parking lot that you're trying to convert was purchased in 70, 73 because we needed the parking for the businesses. Mm -hmm. And it's still needed. And there's boarded up businesses for that reason. And then um, we have, I finally have new tenants in my building. And they, in the last month, we've had four break-ins in the parking lot. Not overnight, just in general. There have been homeless in that neighborhood. And they're kind of distraught. And they are not socialized. And, and I'm not against having that kind of housing. I'm all for it. But socialize them or isolate them till they are socialized. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Marnie Robineau, item five. Okay. I have a newborn you have baby. One minute. And, Go ahead. Sorry. I have a newborn baby, and coming to this meeting is the longest I've been away from him because it's really important that you hear from people who actually live next door to where this project is proposed to be. I believe in common sense approaches to addressing the homelessness issue, like using the space at Cotner. It's disheartening and distressing that the city may spend millions on this project instead, one that is low barrier in terms of the types of people who will be concentrated in a residential neighborhood block, meaning even those with a history of violent crimes will be moved here and will make it untenable for families to walk the neighborhood with young children. I also have concerns for the many small businesses that rely on the parking lot each evening. Already, my favorite restaurant has said they won't renew their lease because this project will decimate their business. As someone who voted for Ms. Yaroslavsky, I'm disturbed to see her pushing this plan just to say she's creating beds, when really this is a low impact project in terms of addressing homelessness, but will have a devastating impact on so many of her constituents. I urge you to please not prove this. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Um, and I'll call the uh, next few names, Adam Smith, John Perez, Ramin, Moira Kelly, um, and I'll call two more names, Jonathan Ross and Branko Berkson. Go ahead, Adam. Good morning. Um, I guess I'm speaking what? only on general comment? Or? Okay, you have one minute. Do I? All right, well, it looks like I have 50 seconds. You have, you have one minute. You okay. can start it again, yeah. Um, my name's Adam from the Human and Civil Rights Committee at the LA Community Action Network. I'm here today on behalf of our committee and other LA CAN members hoping the city will soon be done with a 60-day report back on the cost and efficacy of LAMC 41.18 that was initially introduced by Council Member Yaroslavsky in April that we at LA CAN have been asking for for months as it well over 100 days passed since the report back was due. We are here to request that as chair of the Homelessness and Housing Committee, Council Member Rahman, uh, you work urgently to schedule an independent special hearing that allows the community, including Los Angeles Community Action Network, to also report back on the cost of 4118, knowing that the actual day-to-day -day impact and cost of city policies like 4118 that target and criminalize houseless people cannot be measured in a city council report back. As nearly six houseless people die daily in the city of LA, we know there is a precedent for these special hearings that invite community organizations and look forward to this one being scheduled. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please state your name and the item you're speaking on, or items. John Perez, item five. Okay, you have one minute. I'm a 30 plus year stakeholder in the Rancho Park community. I am adamantly opposed to the Midville Pico project as it would be very detrimental to the vitality, safety, and peace of the small businesses and restaurants along Pico. That parking lot is the lifeblood for the businesses along Pico Boulevard. CD5 staff, said they would be willing to look at alternative sites submitted by the community in lieu of Midville. When the 1900 block of Zapolveda was presented to CD5 staff, they fell in love with it, and they said that that plan <clears throat> would be in addition to, and now not a replacement of Midville. Way to stab your constituents in the back. 
we have a community, we as a community come to you now with a phenomenal plan for Cotner Avenue, just a few blocks away from the Midville project and almost four times as many beds and at a fraction of the cost. Please vote no on the Midville Pico project and have a look at our Cotner, Cotner Avenue project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. And I've called Ramin Gaitan Gaitanchi, Moira yes. Kelly, Jonathan Ross, Branko Berkson. You're Ramin? Good, good afternoon. My name is Ramin Gaitanchi. Uh, and what item are you speaking on? Item number five. Okay, you have one minute. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I, um, I'm a licensed real estate agent. Uh, practicing for the past 18 years. I live on Midville with my wife and my two kids with uh, another kid on the way just in a couple uh, months. Uh, I own and uh, manage apartment buildings that I lease to uh, many homeless projects, so Section 8, HIP, PATH, you name it, I, I, I've done it and I do it. So I'm compassionate about providing housing to them, but you have to provide the correct housing. Uh, this project is directly adjacent to single family homes. My wife, my family, we all walk in that neighborhood. Uh, there's an ice cream shop uh, right adjacent to that. There's multiple restaurants. It's gonna kill those businesses. It's going to impact a lot of families Forget the fact that it's going to drop our property values, which it will. A lot of us have mortgages that are coming up due, and the lenders, they will do an appraisal of this. If your property doesn't appraise thank for you, a certain sir. amount you're, below, you're, you're, who, are you, who are you going to make homeless? Us. If I, if I can't refinance my thank property. Thank you very much. Your time is up. Your time is up. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next speaker, Moira Kelly, Jonathan Ross, Branko Berkson, and I'll call a couple of other names, Peter Lockert, Natalie Meinhart, Matthew Shaw. Okay, next speaker, go ahead. My name is Moira Kelly, and I am um, talking about item five. Okay, you have one minute, please get going. I would like to say that I too live in a very upscale neighborhood called Windsor Square, and I support interim housing in every upscale neighborhood, simply because the reality is, Los Angelinos, we are in a crisis. We need to house our homeless community. Let's use the word empathy. Let's use the idea of sharing land with our unhoused people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Moira. Next speaker. Your name and the item you're speaking on? Jonathan Ross against item number five. I'm also uh, distributing some uh, handouts for the members. Okay, thank you very much. You have one minute. As you may be aware, the City Ethics Commission on September 11th announced it is investigating potential misconduct by CD5 related to the Midvale Pico project. And then again, just two days ago, our group filed a new complaint to ask the commission to investigate two additional apparent serious ethics violations, which subsequently came to light. As public servants, if you're serious about upholding high standards of ethics and government, it's incumbent upon you to allow the ethics investigations to take their full course before you budget any monies for this project which will clearly cause irreparable harm to small businesses and residents. Until these ethics issues are resolved, please do not sully your good names by associating yourselves with this ill-conceived project. There is a much better alternative at Cotner Avenue, which can come online more quickly and at lower cost. Please, ask, please continue this discussion in committee and ask Thank the CD5 to choose Common Sense and Cotner over Midvale. Thank, thank you, Speaker. I'm going to ask people in the, in the chambers once again if you could refrain from clapping or booing so that we can get through speakers. Go ahead. What's your name and the item you're speaking on? Peter is speaking against five. Okay. Uh, and your name? Peter Locker. Peter Locker. Peter. Okay, great. Go ahead. You have one minute. We would like to be here today as collaborators and not adversaries, but that choice was taken away from us when the councilwoman cut the neighborhood and councils out of any discussion or planning process in a betrayal of her campaign promises to mothers, seniors, and children. 
This is not a homelessness issue. I've been a block captain more than seven years. Volunteered at orgs from Chrysalis to St. Joseph's to Salvation Army Westside Transitional Housing. I know the people who need a roof to move forward. We already have a serious issue in our neighborhood with violent drug addicts who use all over the streets, regularly menace employees over struggling minority-owned small businesses, smash windows and sexually threaten residents, and with makeshift weapons. Even if police do make arrests, the people are right back, and no bail means more lunacy. This is an addiction issue, not a homelessness issue. Whatever you have signed, sealed, and delivered, don't drop another bomb on our community and consider the alternative sites we have presented, but you are ignoring, and a workable solution for the actual problem and the voters who trusted Katie. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And we'll call a couple of more speakers. Kevin Sachs, Ira Klein, and Jay Jacoby. Go ahead. Your name and the item you're speaking on. My name, my name is uh, Bronco Berkson. I'm speaking on item five. OK, you have I'm one a, minute. Uh, I am a resident of the uh, neighborhood next to, uh, on near the uh, street of Midvale. I've worked at two businesses that are right there on Midvale and uh, Pico. I live just a less than 10 minute walk from there and I am fully in support of this project. Not only that, all the alternatives that I've heard about, they also need to be built. Our neighborhood and our district does nowhere near enough to solve a problem. And I actually believe that the city and the county themselves are not doing enough and they need to get a lot more help from the federal and state level to get this homeless crisis under control. But a good place to start is to get this homelessness uh, housing built on Midvale. There are already homeless people there. There will be homeless people there regardless of whether it's built or not. So let's at least get them sheltered and do the alternatives so that they're less likely to also be on our streets. But they are there and they're going to continue to be there until we do absolutely more and our district is not pulling its weight. Thank you very much. And your name one more time, speaker? Bronco Berkson and Bronco. Katie, you are a marvel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker. Your name and the item you're speaking on, and I'm going to request that you pull the mic down a little bit. Hi, I'm Natalie Meinhart, and I'm speaking on item number five. Okay, you have one minute. I stand before you today as a concerned resident and a distraught mother in my community, and I feel compelled to express my deep disappointment in the way that this interim housing project has been handled. It's disheartening to witness a project of this magnitude planned in secret, behind the backs of its con constituents, and with a glaring lack of transparency. Public service is meant to be transparent, inclusive, and in the best interests of the community. We respectfully demand the transparency and accountability that we as constituents deserve. Let's work, to work together to find a solution that benefits everyone ensuring a safer, more supportive environment for all members of our community, like Cotner. I ask that you vote no on Midvale Pico, or at the very least continue this meeting until the committee has had a real chance to review the materials, and we also invite the committee members to come see the two alternative sites. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Your name and the item you're speaking on. Uh, Kevin Sachs, item five. Okay, you have one minute. Um, I had a speech, um, but I, I really, I think I would just want to focus on, on one concept, which is opportunity cost. Um, I see the amount of money that's going to be spent, $8 million on this project. This property is worth, what, $10 million for 33 beds. Um, the opportunity cost of the city and this council on spending time on 33 beds, and the city needs huge projects to handle this huge issue. And this, this council can do something. This council can take on and focus its time on large projects that can help this community and that this community would support. Please, take, take that action. I'm a father, I live in this, I live in this neighborhood. I don't want this project, but it's, it's beyond us, it's beyond the neighbors, it's about, it's about solving this crime and making better city for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Your name and the item you're speaking on. Jay Jacoby, item number five. Okay, you have one minute. Uh, this project will spell, spell the ruination of several businesses just recovering from COVID, the safety of a neighborhood with elderly people and families moving in with young children. 
It will also cost millions of dollars to spend irresponsibly since there is now a conceptual plan about 10 blocks away on Cottoner Avenue. It is city owned. It will hold up to 125 people instead of 33 people. And it will cost nothing as opposed to 2.2 million that they're gonna use for those huts to build since there are hundreds of trailers, 500 trailers, the city owned sitting in storage that can house the homeless. And it can be implemented like that. Also, it does not impact local homes or businesses and their encampments set up there now. In addition, we know that this project is taking money away from other districts to fund it, and now they will be able to give a large portion of that back. Cottoner is fast and feasible and will not inflict tremendous hardships and businesses on, on residents alike. Katie and Karen refuse to acknowledge it. We hope you will. Also, I'm Thank on the board of WISM, and I just want to let you know that we had voted no on this project. Thank you very much, Speaker. Next speaker, and I'll call a few more names, Sarah, Matthew Shaw, Margaret Healy, and Kevin Scott. Go ahead. Your name and the item you're speaking on. Afternoon, council members. My name is Ira Klein. This is our Article 5. Okay, you have one minute. Um, my wife and I are 29-year residents and homeowners in CD5, mm -hmm. uh, and we are in support of this project. Um, and simply said, uh, LA Family Housing, which will be managing this, um, has 25 years of affordable management uh, experience with an impeccable track record. Thank you. That's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, your name and the item you're speaking on. Hi, I'm uh, speaking on item five in general public comment. And your name? Sarah Rubenstein. Okay, you have t one minute for the item and one minute for general public comment. Thank Go ahead. You. Uh, my name is Sarah Rubenstein. I'm a member of the Westside Community Plan Advisory Group a man and a manager of homelessness initiatives at United Way and also a longtime CD5 resident. I'm here to support the item five and ask for all of you to do the same. Uh, as a longtime resident, I strongly support this site and Yaroslavsky's efforts to uh, bring long, long overdue interim and permanent housing to the fifth district. Currently, there are no interim housing facilities for individual adults in the district. Interim housing plays a critical role in helping people transition off of the streets and into permanent housing. This project will provide a dignified space for people to come inside and be connected to trauma-informed, housing-focused case management and supportive services, as well as have access to bathrooms, laundry, food, and community space. I want, just wanna thank the team in CD5 for uh, doing really challenging work to cite something in this district. I know it is very hard and uh, previous council members have tried as well uh, for general comment. Um, we know that housing combined with services is really the only thing that ends homelessness and we need more projects like this. If folks have found another site, I welcome more sites in CD5 um, in addition to this one. I really support this project. The provider that you've chosen to work with is wonderful. The facilities you've chosen are really dignified and beautiful, and I think those will support all of our unhoused neighbors who are already living in the district, and I ask you all for support. Also, hello. Thank you. Next speaker, and I'll call a few more names. Goat B, Anita Witherington, Dora Perez, Ira Klein, Jeffrey Ellis, Jens Midton, and Joan Danny. Go ahead, your name and the item you're speaking on. I'm Kevin Scott and I'm supporting project, uh, supporting item five. I support this project. Okay, you have I don't one minute. Okay, I support this project. I don't live near the site, so I'm reading these statements submitted by supporters who live near it but are not available today as it's a work day. My name is Stephen Welch and I live within 500 feet of the Pico Midville Homeless Project. Although I share many of the concerns with those who oppose this project, I cannot do so myself because I believe those concerns are outweighed by the good of helping out 30 souls who are living without a roof over their heads. From Rachel Paterno Mahler, I am a homeowner who lives 0.5 miles from the proposed site. Multiple studies have shown that the best way to get people off the streets is to just give them housing, no strings attached. I support the interim housing at Midville. And from Jack Welch, my name is Jack Welch and I've lived near the proposed site my entire life and shelter for our unhoused neighbors has always been greatly needed. We need to do our part as CD5 is the only district in LA without this type of housing. I support this project because it will give 30 of our neighbors a roof over their heads. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Next speaker. My Your name, name is and the item you're oh, speaking Margaret on. Margaret Healy, item number five. Margaret? Margaret. Oh, okay. The underlying premise for taking this lot is that it is underutilized. This is false. DOT, unfortunately, was not instructed to assess the lot's usage at the dinner hour when adjacent restaurants open and do most of their business and fill the lot. They depend on the lot for their survival. Does it make sense to cause more than 25 businesses to close down in order to house 33 clients? These mom and pop businesses also deserve consideration here, but they were not even informed that of this CD5 hearing today. <clears throat> With regard to safety, LA Family Housing is not responsible for what goes on outside the facilities. Our concern for safety is not NIMBYism. No official in our city should feel comfortable with jeopardizing the safety of their constituency. It's not a case of not in my backyard, but not in anybody's backyard or front yard when it comes to safety of citizens. Please consider the Cotner proposal. That's my last one. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. And I've called a few other names. Goat B, Anita Witherington, Dora Perez, Jeffrey Ellis, Jens Midtun. Your name and the item you're speaking on? Uh, I'm Jeffrey Ellis. I'm on the board of the Westwood South of Santa Monica Homeowners Association and active in the West of Los Angeles Homeowners Association. I'm speaking for myself as an individual. I'd on like item to speak five. general and on item five. Okay, you have I, one minute for each. Sure. I just want to say briefly that I've lived in the West LA area for 35 years and before that I grew up there. We are rich in parking in our neighborhood. The problem is the parking is owned by private businesses who don't want to lease it or allow it to be used by other private businesses. The Guitar Center has over a hundred parking spaces, maybe 20 of them are used on a daily basis, but they won't allow anyone else to use it. And right across the street where the landmark theaters are, there are hundreds of parking spaces privately owned that are not being utilized at all since the landmark theaters closed. I also want to add that businesses on Westwood and on Pico Boulevard have been shutting down for years, and that's due to land speculation and people holding out for better deals for rezoning, and it has nothing to do with the homeless crisis. So that's just a red herring. Now I'd like to speak to item number five. Go ahead. Uh, the Pico Midvale housing project is not perfect, but it is good and it can be developed quickly and efficiently. Many who oppose the project inflame fear and anger by stoking the idea of stereotypes and cliches about unhoused individuals as an organized group of drug addicted, violent criminals and monsters and such aspersions recall similar verbiage used to oppose Eastern European immigration in the United States, se ending segregation in Los Angeles in the 60s, and inflaming homophobic fear about pedophiles molesting our children if they're hired as teachers in our school. The homeless are people just like anyone else. They are unhoused. Some people have drug problems just as housed people do. Some people have mental health issues as some housed people do. But they are human beings and they deserve housing. I was part of a t uh, task force, the CD5, of uh, uh, Councilmember Yaroslavsky's predecessor, and we de tried to develop 50 properties that we were all turned down. We can't continue to say, find a different location. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Shush. Excuse me. Sorry, everyone has to be quiet. Thank you. Next speaker, your name and the item you're speaking on. Yes, my name is Joan Daniels and uh, the item is number five. Okay, you have one minute. Yes, we, uh, I am strongly, vehemently opposed to this project. It doesn't make any sense, and apparently the people that are in back of this, there's some kind of graft or fraud or something going on, because we have not been informed of all the information that's available. We have not been given an opportunity to speak. Today is the only opportunity that I saw that we had to speak, number one. The thing is that the businesses were almost decimated during the, uh, that are nearby on that street during, the co during COVID. This will further decimate those businesses. There was a gentleman that spoke earlier that had businesses, three stores, uh, three stores uh, just west of the project. He knows the problem and he, could he spoke to that. The thing is those people that are in support of this project, 
Most of them that I've spoken today don't, either don't live in the neighborhood, they don't pay taxes in the neighborhood, they are absolutely, they're, they're here to just disrupt. They're, yes, we have a project, we have a, a, a problem, but the problem can be solved by the use of the, the uh, trailers on Cotner, which the city thank has paid, which I... Thank, thank you, thank you for your testimony. Next speaker. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Sorry, and um, speaker, what was? Go ahead, your name and My the name item you're is speaking on. Dora Perez, item number five. Okay, you have one minute. For the guy that just went up, stop making everything about race. I'm an immigrant and I'm not white and I'm opposing this project. Um, the lack of transparency by CDC5 and unwillingness to involve the community in planning and, develop, the, and development of this project has ra raised many red flags. The project is poorly planned and rushed under the pretense that there's an urgent need to help the homeless. There is no question homeless issues plague our communities. However, the Pico Midville project is not a well thought out solution to a statewide crisis involving thousands of homeless. The inadequacies with this project will create more problems for the homeless. Lack of space and staff will create significant safety issues. One security for the whole project is not enough. We can rely on the police to respond quickly to emergency calls since they are also understaffed. Tight quarters will lure residents and visitors to camp or linger outside the facility unsupervised. We believe the Cotner site will be a better location and instead of, the, instead of the Midville project. It will cost much less and it can house up to 125 people. Thank, thank, thank you, Speaker, for your testimony. Next speaker, and I'll call the final speakers on our list. Um, I think I've called everybody. Goat B, Anita Witherington, Jens Mid. Mitun, Lavon, Leana Anderson, Matthew Shaw, and that's all the speakers I have. Go ahead. Hello, this is Jens Midtoon, and I'm speaking on general public comment. Okay, you have one minute. <clears throat> yes, hello. Uh, my name is Jens Midtoon. I'm vice president of outreach for the downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council, and I'm here speaking for myself. Um, the Neighborhood Council has just relaunched our Urban Needs Committee to try to help with homeless issues, and I look forward to collaborating with the city on coming up with solutions. I appreciate the hard work that this committee is doing to address our housing and homelessness crisis, and as you know, homelessness is a housing crisis. Downtown does more than our fair share to tackle the citywide homelessness crisis, but we're happy to do it and I'm glad to see other neighborhoods stepping up to create housing as well. I'm glad to see so many neighbors showing up and being brave and supporting more housing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, your name and the item you're speaking on. Uh, Anita Witherington on number five. Okay, and I'm um, gonna ask you to just bring your microphone a little closer to you. There we go. Okay, I'm a resident of the 2300 block since 1974. Um, we've done a lot of research and it's shown that the facility proposed by Katie Yaroslavsky and she has emphasized that there will be a very low barrier for entry is just detrimental to local businesses and also to the residential neighborhoods. I'm curious of how many people who've spoken against this project have really come to look at where this facility is taking away a very necessary parking lot and I think if you visited the area you would actually see that the proposed Cotner site, which I think would serve the homeless better, is a much better choice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. That's right, yes. All the items in the general comment. Okay, you have two minutes for the items, one minute for yes. general public comment. <laughs> That's I encourage right. you to stay yes. on topic. Yes, I'll try to. You better. Ow! <laughs> yes, so now we get to number five. Yes, so, Katie's under investigation by the John Lee Ethics Commission, is that true? <laughs> and you know that should she be found to have engaged in any crimes, you know there'd be no chance of her being indicted. I mean, no city council members ever get held accountable. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, that would never happen. <laughs> yes. 
I don't know. Does Monica want to raise her children behind bars? Does, uh, how about you, Bob? You want to raise your kids behind those gray bars? These I are not on, so. on how the agenda. You, I'm going to encourage you to stay yes. on the agenda or we're going to move on to general public comment. Yes. I'm talking about number five, fool. <laughs> yes. So I don't think this is a good idea. Looks like you're circumventing the neighborhood council. It looks like you're lying to your constituents. It looks like you're causing what we call overt acts. United States versus Jose Weizar. That's where I got that education. <laughs> so I would defer this, Bob. I, I sense in my little mind here, you know, when I'm eating vegetation, I think about this. <laughs> That I think that this is a bad, bad fucking idea. I wouldn't go for it. <laughs> well, I want you to go for it, but no, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> but one thing is for sure, these cocksuckers here from the city want to spend that $8 million real bad. It's itching in their pockets. Mm, yum, 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 yum. Waste more money and give the 25% payoff to the developer, right, John Lee? So you can go to Vegas and get more strippers before you get indicted. <laughs> now we'll get to the general comment. Now, as you see, everybody, the truth is known, isn't it? That the city council is a criminal enterprise. In fact, let's give it a hand, everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Isn't it great? It only took me seven years to find out about it. Yes. And, of course, nothing would be better then 25 FBI agents coming in here Friday and arresting you right during the middle of public comment. If you're out there, FBI, please, when I'm up here speaking Friday, just come in here with the arrest warrants and do it in front of me. I would be so happy, I don't think I'd be able to come back here. I'd be laughing every fucking day of my life. <laughs> This yes, is not, Bob. not part of the subject oh, of this sure committee. It is. It's about your future jail term. Yes, I think that's on topic. So I'd say let's continue number five. Let's go home to your kids and say, Mommy does not want to raise you behind federal bars. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Next speaker, please. Your name and the items you're speaking on? Hi, my name is uh, LaVon Colette. Um, I don't know how to follow that exactly. Sorry, we, we can't huh. hear you. Okay, Hi, my name is LaVon Colette. LaVon, okay, great. And, and what I item I would like to on? have general uh, speaking and also item five. Okay, so you have one minute for each. Thank Go ahead. you. I strongly support this Pico Mid Midvale project, the, um, the one on Cotner and the one on Sepulveda. Whatever we can do to get people housed, Please do it. I have a daughter who is out there, and she's homeless, and she's mentally ill. And I am the grandmother of small children. I have, and I am raising, her nine-year-old child, because that is not a good place for him to live. I asked my daughter to come with me today, but she can't leave her stuff or it'll get stolen. Let us be united and take this step. Please build it. Please build anything. And please follow it up with mental health help and drug addiction help. Whatever you do, wherever you are. I'm from Venice. I'm in District 11. We have homeless everywhere. We have plenty of projects all around us. I'm not here to complain about that. I say, these people need to take their turn. Yeah, CD5 needs to take their turn as well. Every city needs to take their turn. We all have to do something. When I go and apply for an apartment for my daughter, I'm 68 years old. I'm a retired registered nurse, and I don't qualify because I'm too old, because I I'm not working anymore. I am a landlord, by the way, so I'm also contributing to the higher rent. I do own rental property in Los Angeles. So it's hard for me on both sides. I'm torn on both sides. Because, you know, whatever the market will bear, right? But I feel for my daughter, 
and I see the people that are around her. And she was not like that when she went out there homeless. She was a good person working, and I've just seen her go in a year and a half downhill. Thank, thank you so much for your testimony. We, we appreciate it. Next speaker, please. Hi, good afternoon. Your name and the item you'd like I'm to I'm a transplant recipient who delayed a hospital admission, and I'm not well, so bear with me if I start coughing. I am Leana Anderson speaking on item number five. Okay, you have one minute. <coughs> I live a block from the proposed shelter. A few weeks ago, I, a mixed race black woman, one of four black people who live on the street, was a victim of a hate incident where a man threatened me by saying, I'm going to get you, you're going to die in word B. He came back across from my house with a metal spear and officers told me that they could not arrest him because he did not say, I'm going to kill you. I could only get a restraining order, which I refused. Why are you proposing a shelter next to residences and restaurants? Why would you move 33 people next to children and seniors when there are already more than 50 who live on and around Cotner over a mile away? I have compassion for the homeless, but why is my safety being compromised? Providing a roof and three meals a day won't stop dangerous behaviors. We've been told residents of the shelter may have criminal pasts, but they would be vetted using Megan's Law Sex Offender Registry. How? Can that be when the mayor announced that people would move people into housing and have 60 days to prove who they are? Shame on Katie Yaroslavsky. She needs to stop being a coward. Come tell us why you won't consider the Cotner Project that will serve four times as many for Thank less and be implemented Thank in less. Thank you, Speaker. Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Okay, we have uh, Carmel. No, wait, sorry. Yeah, Carmel Lastra, and I think that's it, and Matthew Shaw. Carmel and Matthew Shaw. Those are the final speakers that we have going once. Oh, okay, go ahead. Welcome. Hi, Your name and the item you're speaking on? Carmel Lastra, item five. Okay, you have one minute. Hi, yes. Um, I really don't appreciate people telling us that we're NIMBYs because we're really not NIMBYs. We have an alternative site. It's called Cotner, and that's what I want to, this, this whole virtue signaling and saying that we're NIMBYs, I can't stand it. Most people can't stand it anymore. It's, it's, it's just too much. I'll, I'll get to my speech. Um, I'm writing to, I'm, I'm here to express my strong opposition of the proposed Midvale Pico Interim Housing Project. I request that the committee deny the request to fund the project for many reasons. The proposed location is dangerous for neighborhoods, many of which have small ch children, including myself. And it'll be difficult for one unarmed person. I don't even know how much they're going to get paid. Are they minimum wage? They're going to be standing there. Clearly, they're not going to be watching these residents. And um, a lot of them are going to be mentally ill, addicted to drugs. We don't know because we weren't given any transparency on who these people are coming in. Again, we're not NIMBYs. We're just concerned. We have a Cotner location. Um, I'm concerned this would decimate the small businesses in this corridor as well. And Thank you, Speaker. We appreciate your testimony. Thank you very much. Matthew Shaw, going once, going twice. Okay, and with that, we've exhausted public comment for today's meeting. Okay, so um, I'm gonna recommend that we take items one through four, seven and eight on consent, unless there's objections. Seeing none, let's vote on those items. Council Member Ahmed. Yes. Council Member Blumenfield. Aye. Council Member Harris Dawson. Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. Four ayes and those items are approved by Madam okay. Chair. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, let's start off with item Let's start off with item five. Mr. Blumenfield, you had questions, is that correct? Hmm? No? No, I'm being down. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> no, I've, I've heard enough. You've heard enough? I, yes. I, I mean, I'm happy to have, have discussion about it, but I, I've heard about it. I'm happy to make comment about it, too, if you want. Oh. If sure. I, I pulled it off of our, our 
to, uh, I thought you had wanted to ask some questions to staff, so if we could have staff come to the table. Oh, well, I mean, I figured it's a discussion item, but I mean, I'll, I've listened to all the comments, certainly. Listen, we all have these in our district. Four years ago, I didn't have any interim sites in my district, uh, and I put, had these very same discussions. Uh, the fear is always worse than the reality about these sites. Um, there are sites in my district, in, we, in Reseda, right across from residents. There are sites in Tarzana, right down the street from a preschool and residence. I have another site in Canoga Park. All of these in the last few years, all of the same arguments that everybody here is making against these projects were made on all of these other projects. We have a crisis. We have to lean in and do this everywhere. It's not easy to do it. As a, as a council member, and I applaud Councilwoman Yaroslavsky for coming forward to, to uh, bring this project. There's no projects like this in her district. Her district is like what my district was uh, four and a half years ago. But in that process, we have created the interim sites. Uh, and the idea of these sites is to get people off the streets who are causing the issues in the immediate area and to get them into a place where there is supervision. Uh, you know, people are concerned about uh, you know, camping and this. Well, that's what you have now in these locations. But you'd much rather have a situation where people are uh, in an environment that's supervised, where they can get to that next step. And then, uh, in addition, one of the things Ms. Sheroslavsky has done here, which I did on all my sites, is you create a 4118 zone around the site. So you have a 1,000-foot buffer zone around the site where the encampments are not allowed. That's something you don't have right now. Right now, in, at that location and all these other locations. Sorry, okay. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to, if you don't mind pausing for just one second. We're going to have to ask for people in the audience to remain silent. Otherwise, you will be asked to leave. Mr. Blumenfield, please continue. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so this is a difficult thing. There, there certainly there are cost questions. And I know Ms. Sheroslavsky has looked at these other sites, and, and I'm certainly happy to hear, hear from, from her if she wants or from her representative to speak about those other sites. But, the, but we need to move forward on multiple locations, and we're going to need to do more in, uh, in CD5 as well. I'm sorry, I'm interrupt. Could you please remove yes. whoever, who's ever speaking yes, over me? Yes, um, if we could have one of the sergeants here. Whoever is speaking... If you speak again, we will remove you. You've been warned multiple times. Yeah, and, I, and I'm not speaking to be antagonistic. I really hear your concerns that, that people are raising. And I've had the same, I've had a lot of meetings with folks in my community with the exact same concerns. And I'm very sympathetic. You know, all of us not only represent these areas, we all live in these areas. We all are, are, are affected by homelessness. And, but the, the concerns are, are, you know, Again, the real concerns end up being much different than the fears. The concerns about property value. Well, I could tell you in the, in the area, because I've actually followed the property value of all the interim sites in my area, it has not gone down compared to other areas. And you can use actual data and numbers to see that. Uh, you know, you talk about, uh, about the crime that's happening now. Well, that's happening now, and, and you want to prevent that in the future. It's... A site like this does not have to be a magnet. In fact, it can be the opposite. It can be a place where people move on and where we get the people who are currently in your neighborhood walking with a shopping cart. They're not going to be doing that if they have a place for their stuff. Uh, they're not going to be, you know, defecating in the street if they have a place with a restroom. These are the concerns that people raise, but these are also the concerns that get dealt with. And this, frankly, is a very small site compared the one in behind my office, which, which is right across from single family homes, is 50 plus units. The one in Tarzana, right down the street from the preschool, right near homes, 74 units. Uh, so I hear all the concerns about 33 units, and frankly, uh, that's, a very, that's one of the smaller sites that we have, and the impact is going to be uh, smaller than all the other sites. So while I have concerns, you know, always have concerns about cost, and, and I have some questions about why we're going with the uh, the units that have the restrooms in them as compared to the, the cabins that don't. And I have a number of those questions, but I, you know, no one here in this discussion cares about those issues, so I, I can have those questions addressed separately offline, uh, and, just, and just I will uh, urge support of this motion. Great. Thank you. Any other speakers on this item? No. 
Great, and I just, I do want to say that uh, in Council District 4 as well, when I was first elected, we did not have many interim housing sites at all. And when we opened up our interim housing site with 144 beds, in, entire encampments that were near the site disappeared because all of the people in those encampments went indoors into a facility which had a security guard in front of it and the neighborhood around it became safer as a result of those sites. So I do want to just say that you can see real benefits in your neighborhood from those sites and the way that interim housing sites currently are managed within the city, you need to have these beds in a council district in order for people in that council district who are experiencing homelessness to go into them. And so having them in Council District 5 will actually enable Council District 5 residents to benefit uh, from these sites. So I just wanted to underscore what Councilmember Blumenfield said um, and also add uh, our own perspective from Council District 4, which also has interim housing sites right near um, residential neighborhoods, backing right up into it, and, um, and we've had a, 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 a community benefits as a result of it because people who are living on the streets can go indoors where they can be provided um, three meals a day, of course, but also health care, mental health care, um, and, and other services. So with that, I want to move to a vote on this item. Councilmember Ahmed? Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield? Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson? Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. Councilmember Lee? Aye. Five ayes and item five is approved by the chair. Thank you very much. Let's move on to item nine. Do you wanna read item nine into the record? Item number nine is a CEO report relative to creating a standardized request for proposal and or other process for privately owned parcels and buildings to be considered for development or acquisition as interim housing sites, along with funding options of the recommend, recommended process. This item was continued from the Housing and Homelessness Committee meeting of September 29, 2023. Okay, let's give it a minute for the chambers to clear and then we can get started. Welcome. So I am excited about hearing this item because the thinking behind the original motion, which is which is my motion, was really to think about how we can think about a new policy here in the city of Los Angeles through which we can find sites for interim housing. When I first came into office, we had um, we actually ended up looking within our own district using staff resources, as well as relying on a private real estate consultant who helped us identify potential sites for interim housing in the district. Mr. Sachs, I'm gonna ask that. Thank you. Yeah. He hadn't said anything before, so he hadn't said anything before. Mr. Sachs, I'm going to ask that you be quiet on your way out. Thank you. For rule 7, for rule 12. Okay. And wanted to find a way that would enable us to look for sites in a more efficient way. And there are models in other cities that have generated many more beds in interim housing facilities. Um, that essentially if you are able to set out a clear set of criteria for what an interim housing facility needs to have, that a private market essentially is formed around those facilities. Um, and that real estate brokers or property owners are able to bring qualifying sites to the city instead of the city having to go out and look for those sites 
and then once those sites are found, potentially actually having to make the investments in order to make those sites fit the needs of the city. Um, and so for me, I think making it clear what the city is looking for and how it will judge projects that are potential properties that are coming before it for use as interim housing, I think can help us actually have a much more efficient and effective process in citing interim housing. And so I was excited about this, um, and, but I do, the way that the report is structured, I have a lot of questions um, about what is in the report and what you're recommending. And to me, what has been challenging about the report is that it doesn't seem to change that much about our current process. Um, and so I was wondering whether you could provide us a little overview of what you have proposed in the report and we can open it up to the committee for discussion and questions. Uh, Ed Gibson with the CAO's office, thank you for, the, for those opening comments. And Hopefully I think we're seeing things the same way. There's some nuances in this document that are, are kind of key to what you're asking for, so mm -hmm. it's about how we move forward and, and implement those. I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Annabelle to run over the, the, the opening comments here and walk through a few things and then we'll come back to questions in more detail if that, if that helps. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Annabelle Gonzalez with the CAO's office. Um, in front of you today is the interim housing request for proposal and review process report. As an overview, this report outlines a request for proposal and recommends the approval of the standardized site review process for citywide interim housing consideration, as well as an instruction to the General Services Department to develop an interim housing acquisition diligence checklist. Uh, the goal of this report is to set the framework to increase the production of interim housing by providing a request for proposal and a more clear understanding of property characteristics that are being sought. This report lays out the updated standards for a property being considered for interim housing. The aim was to lay out a request for proposal process and update the interim housing review standards. There are a few key things that should be noted, the first being that the report provides one procurement process, but two similar paths distinguishable by how money is made available Could and I then allocated. that you just pull the microphone a little closer to you or sure. speak a little louder? Sure. Apologies. There are a few key things that should be noted, the first being that the report provides one procurement process, but two similar paths distinguishable by how money is made available and then allocated. The first is a request for proposal, or an RFP, and the second is a request for qualifications, or an RFQ. Both processes will have the same outcome with notable differences in their speed and impact. A, an RFP requires funding, comments, and input presented at the beginning with minimal input during the process. Findings and recommendations are presented at the end of the process at which council will vote on the recommendations. On the other hand, a request for qualifications allows input during the process as projects are submitted for review and assessed as interim housing. This process has more flexibility and will allow sites to be submitted and reviewed on a rolling basis, but it does not provide the certainty of funding to property owners to engage. Another key note to flag is that our main funding sources to date have been federal and state grant funds. These funds were awarded sporadically and have restrictions such as expenditure deadlines and guidelines making it difficult to plan for in the future. But if less restrictive funding sources are made available, such as general funds, it would provide more certainty to the market and the process. The options in front of you today are dependent on funding av availability, but the process may also be used as an assessment tool moving forward. And we appreciate your time, and we're happy to answer any questions. Can you talk a little bit more about the process that you've set out here and how this differs or is similar to what is currently happening for siting and room housing in the city? Uh, go ahead. So um, it was laid out in a previous report back, uh, created by the CAO back in 2021. Um, this does expand on that process, giving more details on what is sought on for, um, for interim housing. Um, and this process can be used for either process, either an RFP or an RFQ. Um, the main difference being the identification of funding. If it's um, identified beforehand, an RFP can actually be completed and be taken through the entire process, which takes about nine months. Um, with an RFQ, um, sites can be reviewed on a rolling basis. Um, and since um, the funding that we have been using is mostly federal grant state funds, um, it's not recommended to uh, allocate funding for projects that not have been fully assessed. So um, 
Sorry, say that again. Yeah. I didn't understand that. Uh, funding is not recommended to be utilized, either the state or the grant funds, uh, for projects that have not been fully assessed. So if a property hasn't, been, hasn't gone through the feasibility uh, assessment, um, we wouldn't recommend moving forward with, with allocating funds to a project. But that's what front. the process is about, right? Is Correct. How do you do that assessment process? Correct. So to, to add upon what Annabelle is, is saying, there was some existing ordinance and stuff that laid out how some of this process worked that was done a few years ago. It had some key elements that weren't really fully all the way flushed out as we know in practice of going through this day in and day out when we look at sites. And so one of the key things we wanted to do and, and that we definitely want approval of in here is we added some additional items for review and for consideration. And we also worked with BOE to develop a, a list of items for review for things that aren't city-owned sites. We have gone through city-owned sites over and over again, but the inquiries that we get are coming from outside, and we wanted to have a piece of paper in a document in one place that somebody could look and actually say, oh, that's what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And what we wanted that to be is a forward-facing document so that we actually can have this conversation without going out or waiting for somebody to show up. We actually had something, this is what we're looking for, here's the minimums. If you have something and you're interested, let us know. And so that's what this document that's is? That's what this document is. And if we do an RFP, the only thing you have to do is add the hard money to it and we just put the scoring criteria based on whatever it is we're going to go after that moment because whether it's family or adult males or whatever that category is, we need to make the adjustment accordingly. But this fleshes out those details of minimum size that we need to know, location, those different types of things necessary for the market to actually participate much, much easier. So the hope is that that we're close to the same page of what you mentioned when you, with your opening comments as well, is that we're looking to have a document ourselves, as well as all of you, for the same goal, is that someone can look over and say, you know what, my property looks like what they might want. And they reach out to us, as well as we have a document that we can post and say, if you have this, come see us. And if we have money placed aside, we can say, come apply for this. And so, um, this is how we try to lay that out. Now, what's inside the document that may cause some confusion or two of things? It's terminology, and every time you say RFQ, RFP, RFI, that stuff tries, you know, it's trying to be something technical, but there are, everyone knows what the RFP, RFP is, send us your project. The RFQ is really more of an RFI. Let's just say no money was set aside, which is kind of how we have today. We have, we have a little bit of money here, a little bit of money there, we reprogram. But we have this process that's out there like, if you have something, please send it to us. That's really what the RFQ is trying to say is, post it. If you have something, even though I don't have a formal RFP, please submit it. Please submit it because we want to talk to you about it. And we'll, if it's that, if it meets some certain criteria that we outline here, lay out here, then that's a fantastic uh, moment to help increase the availability of items that we're looking for. So yes, I think Kelsey. this is where uh, I struggle a little bit with with this process as it is today. I think we have been out there asking for the, asking the public for housing sites, for hotel motels. Um, we've made general calls to, to property owners to bring, bring opportunities to us. But I think even as somebody who is, you know, in a council office trying to bring opportunities to the city, I find the process of how the city makes, makes decisions on which projects to fund and which that we're not funding, very opaque. And I think in order for private, for the private market to be able to play a, a stronger role in generating feasible sites, there has to be greater clarity than, I, I did not get that from this particular document on how you actually prioritize a site for funding or how you actually say that this site is eligible for that kind of funding because even as somebody within the city, I have I had very little visibility into that. It feels ad hoc. I, I think we're, we're, I didn't get your comment, thank you. Some, more, some council officers more active in this arena than others. I would say in general, the city has not done the outreach in the manner that would generate as a whole to go out and facilitate these sites. Some phone calls to hotels and motels has definitely happened, just such as yours, very much so, appreciate it. But overall, 
we haven't had some consistent outlying something just to start with and that is what we've brought forward is that beginning document the key to make most of all of these things work has never been that complicated say what you're looking for and say how much money you have available we have never openly said but this, RFP, this document doesn't say what how much money we have available it just says because we don't have any money available at the moment. So I mean, we, we've made commitments to generating interim beds under lawsuits. We have made commitments. We've set aside dollars for interim housing through the Inside Safe program. And we have money available because we've made commitments to spend dollars. We just don't know exactly what those dollars are. But I think it would be, it's important to start. I, I agree. I, and what I don't want to be is argumentative because I think we're saying the same thing, quite honestly. Where we put money also has impact on whether it's available for when we talk about a process and don't talk about a process and how folks go about it. But we've gone about trying to lay out the process and what we're, what we're looking for. If money is put in a place that makes this more possible, that is fantastic. There was money in, in the budget, right? Yeah. No, we, I can be very, there was money placed inside the budget. It was placed in, inside safe. This wasn't there at that time, the, the base was, but that went about a different process by, by, a, different, by a different group for a different reason. Um, but we're trying to put what you want in place. When I, I, it's, honestly, I still feel like we're closer than we feel at the moment, but I, I'm hoping we're, we are anyway, um, by putting that in place. When, let, if we played the hypothetical game, if that's fine, let's just say there's $50 million available today. And we're going to put $50 million available for an RFP. Fantastic. Which, what, what are we going to target? Uh, we're just going to go with this first round, adult, adults. OK, fantastic. We want sizes um, no less than 30 because economies of scale. I think we prefer to have 50, 50 units or more, 50 beds or more, up to 100. We're looking for sites zoned in whatever areas at council districts. We're going to prioritize those who do based on point in time counts versus those who don't have shelters in order and we're going to put a scoring priority on that we're going to come back and give that to you real quick based on that population and the need and where we're trying to excuse me trying to target those we've given the framework to do that mm -hmm. in very short order but you also know we have families and if someone starts around and say hey we want to do families we're going to slip in a couple of extra criteria because families are going to need right, a couple right. extra criteria as, as well as for the type of unit we're actually going to put in place mm -hmm. because families are needing a different type of unit type. I, you know, I think what right. I would like to see in addition to this um, for me is also a potential source of funds or a, an, an identification of how much funds can be put through a process like this to, to generate potentially a better way of finding interim housing here in Los Angeles. Um, and I want to know you know, especially given the commitments we've already made. We have made commitments in a lawsuit to generate a number of new, new beds, a number of new units across the entire city. Um, I think it's important for us to be able to put into place a new process, but also to identify where the, what, what amount of money we're going to be putting towards it and where those dollars are going to be coming from as we move forward. I think that amount of planning is important for us to be doing. I agree. Ms. Rahman? If I, sorry, um, yeah, could I just, mm -hmm. um, I also, I think really, for me, it's important to also understand what has worked about other cities that have these processes, um, because having looked at the RFPs in those other cities, first of all, they are RFPs, not RFQs, and so I think having an RFP to me feels much more viable, because there is money behind it, in actually generating private response to um, to this kind of request. But I think it would also be useful to look at those existing RFPs and to say, what is it about them besides the guaranteed funding, but the specifics of what they're offering, what we're, what we're saying here, feels more general um, and less specific than what another city is offering um, as a, in, in these kinds of requests. 
Understood, and I, I do want you to realize we did look at other cities. We've looked at New York. We've we've reached around. They they have s certain criteria specific to how they where they want each one placed and about how many units they're going to have. They they also have their own set of issues. Uh, they also have the ability to put a great deal of money behind it and continuously and then engul in, in involve more of the private sector uh, along the way. A little bit of it's a little bit different. I acknowledge that it's very much the same as we are making a very similar step, but I, I do just want to say this is a step, and, mm -hmm. and it's a pretty big step because yeah, it's important. We just w without it, we're just kind of floundering, and so we're sitting the putting the pieces in place, mm -hmm. and then we're having this conversation today. Thank you um, to further it so that we actually have a common understanding of what we're all thinking. And then all you got to do is drop in those last pieces of, of what you want. And that comes down to what I think you're talking about is the score, scoring criteria and the priorities. And that's why they're touched on in this document, but they're not spoken on what the city's policy is. But we note a couple of the priorities that you're, you're going to want to look at. Point in time, dispersion of the units, what type of units do we need, mm -hmm. where are existing uh, interim housing. And the given is we already know we need more. Mm -hmm. We unequivocally right. know we need more. And some of that more is interim. Some of that more is permanent supportive housing as well. So. Right. Okay. You have a comment? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I, you know, I, I completely understand, and I just wanted to kind of recap even the most recent history of what has really driven so much of how we approached uh, all of this. When you talk about, for example, some of... Uh, some of what the CAO was involved in when we were standing up uh, the interim sites as rapidly as we were in response to uh, ju the Judge Carter and the, the beds, we were trying to stand up and get into compliance with a certain amount of units by, a, by certain timelines. And what the CAO's guide, uh, guide star for that was based on how do we generate the most amount of housing based on the amount of money that we have and deliver it in a timely fashion. And so what why a lot of locations fell out it was based on the fact that it was cost prohibitive because we were trying to find the maximum number of units to be deployed in the most in the fastest fashion uh, and so that was the precursor that innate that it initiated all of this right for in terms of what uh, those interim sites were now we're in a circumstance where okay now we we've got you know we want to ensure uh, the distribution, the, the you know, because we also have the alliance settlement, we were e we were looking at the thresholds, whether it was a citywide or a district by district threshold. But so much of we have to remember in government our fundamental obligation, and what the CAO uh, and everybody involved is required to do, is we also have to look at the dollars and cents of maximizing the amount of resources that we have available to actually deploy and open up these sites. And that was a determinant factor with whether or not we went with an RFP versus an RFQ. I think very simply, the standard is very clear. For an RFP, you've, you already know, I've got this amount of money, this is the qualifying criteria, these are the rules associated with how we can select these locations, and, and I've got $10 million or whatever the amount is available for this. Uh, for, uh, you know, for, and that's for an RFP. For an RFQ, it's like, well, you know, if we have the money and we don't know, and again, it all depends on the flexibility of the funds that we have, uh, which by the way, I just want to remind everybody, Inside Safe, we get, we, you, you gave all that money uh, on a Starbucks card, and that is the most flexible amount of money. If we wanted to say those dollars could be to stand up X amount of units, we could do that, but it was not, prescribed in that way. We could have very well dictated that with the dollars that were programmed for Inside Safe, but that's not how this council chose to proceed. So I, it's just, so, but otherwise you would be able to say, we're gonna give X amount of dollars, whatever it is, to stand up those interim units in order to achieve that. Now the other part of the equation that this council will have to grapple with, and it's a policy that is not determined by the CAO, is not determined by anybody but this council as a legislative body, and you have the authority to do this if everyone chooses to do it or relegate its authority. But the bottom line is you have to determine what we're willing to pay 
uh, per unit. And when you do that RFQ, whether or not you're going to make accommodations for the distribution and equity across the city in order to fulfill that and understanding of what you give up when you, when you, uh, when you make those types of determinations. Because otherwise, then you find the circumstances where the CD8s, the CD9s, the CD7s, the CD6, the CD1s are always the one that disproportionately house or create the most opportunities in these environments to provide uh, these housing solutions. So again, it all fundamentally comes back to the same question. And it's all dependent on this body to determine which way they want to proceed. So it's, I, I don't blame uh, anybody other than the legislative body to make that determination to finally once and for all say you're either going to preserve the authority with, with the purse strings to determine which way we want to proceed and if you wanted to do an RFQ in order to do that you can do that uh, or if you dedicated the money and say okay we've got 150 million dollars let's let's go for an RFP for that you could do that too but you know, again, it, we are the victims of our own acts, and that's that's kind of that's where it stands. I mean, I so I appreciate uh, what how you're further delineating this, uh, but the truth of the matter is, it's you know, there's a, we only have ourselves to blame for how this is all rolled out, and much of it is rolled out predominantly based on the limitations of the dollars that were availed to us. Uh, the, you know, from the state, from the federal relief, all of those things, the rules and guidelines associated with that dictated how we would spend it in an expedient manner so that we could stand up these units as quickly as possible. And that's how we did it. So, uh, you know, so I, I just want to be really clear because I'm always, I, you know, I, I don't want to blame staff because we are the policy makers and we have to own that responsibility of the decisions that were made, how we got here and why we're now here and how we choose to go forward still resides in the power and the authority if this council should it decide to preserve that right and not give it away. And so that's, that's, where, that's where it is. And I think, you know, depending upon whether or not we either dedicate general fund dollars to more of that or we wait to see if uh, the feds or the state decide to allocate more funds, uh, at that point, depending, it's all really dependent upon the source of funds that dictate how we proceed going forward. And so I just, it's, I, so I appreciate the report. You're providing more clarity. I understand that the need to, to try to be more responsive um, to doing that part, but it all comes down to how we choose to allocate these resources or, or uh, determine how we intend to spend the resources that we have, that we've you know, given the authority to others to, to dictate, but we could think, we could preserve that right. Thank you. Oh, actually, I think Mr. Lee had his hand up first and then, no? no. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Bloomfield. That's fine. Um, anyway, I, I love the idea of us trying to unleash the private sector to get more interim housing, so I really appreciate the, the, the spirit and the action of this, this motion. Um, and I just want to make sure that that we are letting a, fla a thousand flowers bloom as we do this, and we're not, we don't end up being so prescriptive that we, we lose out on opportunities. When we did this sort of with, with Triple H and they did the Innovation Fund, we lost out on some opportunities, in a sense. Particularly, the story in my district, I had a, a developer who I was going back and forth with, and I got him to agree to, to transform a luxury apartment that he had just built into affordable housing. Uh, but in order to make that pencil out, it would have to be different, not on a per unit basis. You'd take these four bedroom, beautiful rooms and make them into group housing. And if, for example, in this case, you sort of golden girls situation for seniors and, and friends for the duplexes. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't pencil out with Triple H because we were limited to this per unit analysis. Mm -hmm. And so it was not going to pencil out and yet it was an opportunity that was before us that, and, and I went very far to the mat. I got a private developer to come in, a uh, nonprofit developer, pro do a whole proposal, went through all the steps, but it couldn't get to that step because we got in our own way. And potentially with, with something like this where we're unleashing the private sector, proposals like that, creative proposals come in that we haven't thought about 
that may not even fit in this criteria. I just want to make sure that we are, we are creating an opening for a thousand flowers to bloom. Uh, you know, whether it's, it says minimum 50 bed count for economies of scale, that makes sense in a traditional model. But if it's not a traditional model, you know, if for example, if someone's figured out a way to master lease ADUs uh, and then they're one-offs, it might, there might be another way to go. Or, you know, 10,000, you know, a certain number of foot footage. All, all of these things are good to show what we're looking for, but I, I want to make sure that we, we're opening the door. I don't want to lose another project like what with that, you, that building that I have to drive by all the time that I know could have housed, you know, 58 people, but instead it's now a luxury building um, because we're going to because we're going to be under the same rules that we were under with Triple H or, or whatever strict rules that we're under. Yeah. Uh, understood. I, I think when we looked at this, I don't know if it's 50, but I have in my head 30 is the minimum size because below 30 it starts to become very problematic and 50 is more ideal, but whatever the exact words are in here. But um, I agree with you. We tried to make sure that we tried to give some minimum square footage, just particularly for the site, just because the layout itself doesn't necessarily by the time you get done with some setbacks and other issues, the conversation always tends to go sideways before it goes goes forward. I think it was a guideline, not not a overly prescriptive, but it depends on how it's implemented. So if we call it the RFQ or the open rolling, it provides you, this is the type of thing we're looking for, but if you think you have something else, it does not keep you from talking to us. Mm -hmm. What it's designed to do is make it more well known exactly the type of things we'd like to have but then if you have a one-off or you have something unique, come talk to us still. When we move to an, if we move to an RFP process where you lock that down, it will become totally prescriptive on what we're after at that moment in time. So whether we do some type of hybrid, which I'm not against, and we do set aside some for rolling bases, some on just an RFP, policy conversation to be had here, but we tried to make sure we were trying to keep things open without telling you overly that we're not going to talk to you about it. But we know from the calls we get, and, and honestly, we get calls, but I'd rather have a different type of call, quite honestly. I'd rather have more calls of people closer to what we want than the calls that we get now of, well, you know, that, that your, your zoning's an issue, your size is whatever it, whatever it may be. Because there's folks out there who take the time to listen when we talk to them, and then they come back with something. And one of the things I hope from this document is that it becomes more forward-facing because it is not a forward-facing conversation now at all. And I think that's the challenge for and, us. And with the forward-facing, and because and, and I had other projects like the Knights of Columbus where we, it was, we couldn't get it to, to put the square peg in the round hole. One of the things in order to get folks to come forward is for them to understand uh, cost. Because a lot of people may have very creative ideas um, but if they, they're not going to come to us if they think that it's out of range. It, like there needs to be some, you know, what is the cost per bed or the cost per unit or, you know, wh what are the measurements we're looking for uh, in order to make a, a project score high on our list, even though we're not dictating all the, all the four corners of those projects. Yeah, and I think, and yes, we, we would need that. And that becomes a little bit of a policy conversation as well when we start to talk about what is it that we're exactly going to our RFP? Well, because at the, may, maybe not even there because we may are, if somebody comes to us with a project before we've done an RFP, um, we may decide to do an RFP because they've told us about a unique way and, and just to go, to go through that process. Yeah. But I mean, if, if they have a, 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 a creative solution, they want to mm -hmm. turn an old, I, School I wonder if there's a way to think about incorporating that by asking for certain criteria for the 30 unit or 50 unit, you know, suggested minimums, but also providing an alternative pathway where you say if you can meet this number of beds at this cost, that we're open to those as well. You know, ra so rather than doing it exclusively as a 30 unit minimum at this site, rather having it be a right. set of units that are uh, being discussed and it can be a pathway but it doesn't all have to be at the same geographic location or something like that. Okay. And when we, when we, oh, you say something? Yeah, um, I really appreciate this conversation. I think it's very important that we do have this, this entire um, a conversation regarding uh, how we bring units online but I think something that also needs to be noted in this entire process is the consideration of need. 
Um, we can talk about if, you, if your building has this many units or can, pr can provide this many beds, it really also depends on the need of the actual, of your district or that, of that the actual, city, of the yeah. city. And, I mean, to spit a or city of the, of the neighborhood. So um, it's gonna require a lot of coordination, um, but that is something else that needs to be considered. So if something is going to be released, something along that follows these guidelines, then it's going to require items like population, um, possible service provider or services to be provided. Um, and I know that we've seen in other projects that this has, in recent projects, we've seen um, that these considerations were um, thought of afterwards, but um, we now that just supports this entire uh, process that if we, if those are outlined ahead of time, then it will actually uh, make the, the process more efficient. Mm -hmm. So That's right. Mr. Bloomfield, did you have additional questions? Okay. okay. Uh, Mr. Lee? No, I, I, mean, it, I think it's similar to what Councilman Bloomfield is saying that, I mean, doesn't RFQ just provide us more flexibility and, and instead of limiting sort of our options or more flexibility to find like, because I, I believe during the last round and uh, that there were some properties that maybe I, I wasn't thinking of or, or the scope, size, a motel in my district that responded and then we knew it was available so then we could then take a look at that and try to see how that fit within our plans in council district 12 and so yeah so the i, I, will I don't want to limit us you yeah know. we got a couple things going on there in which i appreciate that comment as well because we have what we're talking about here for you know interim for interim housing we go out then we also had the home key three which was mm -hmm. uh, managed by the, the housing department in a different way, but it decided to do interim in this particular round because of those instructions they were given. And so, um, but we, we weren't necessarily on the same page. And I think that's a whole thing about making sure we all end up on the, on the same page about what we're all looking for when you go out. Because there's, there's was kind of an RFQ, RFP as, as, as well. And you could talk and you could walk through that. But um, it is important that we want to all end up on a similar page that we understand what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And yes, to answer your question, is this provides you more flexibility um, with that, whatever path you're going to go. But if you're doing an RFQ, it does give you a little bit more flexibility. It does not get you, boom, all the housing, but it gives you an opportunity for limited pot or, or just having a conversation about what it is you want to target and how, how large you want it to be mm -hmm. or what it is you're looking at that may be unique and flexible at that at that moment so those are those are all key considerations and the rfq side of this conversation does take that into account it's the trade-off between switching that letter to a p to an mm -hmm. rfp sounds good but they're important yes. mr lee any other questions no nope. okay mr harris dawson um thank you i wanted to go back to the um sort of original uh set of comments from Ms. rodriguez and and Ms. Rahman uh about how you actually pull the trigger on a project or not. Mm -hmm. um, because that's the, I, again, the nomenclature RFQ, RFI, like, like that's all great and I, it does help clarify the inputs that the city gets, uh, but then there's the outputs. And, and, and I'll give you a very concrete example that's very pertinent today. The previous council member from Council District 5, and I believe he was telling the truth, would routinely say, we can't do bridge home or anything in my district because it's too expensive. And he because was, he was told it was too expensive. Because he was told that by the, I, was, I, I would be in the room when the CAO would tell them that this parking lot, and I, I really believe, don't quote me on this, I really believe the one we were talking about today was one of them, uh, that he said, oh, we should do it here. And the, the answer he got back from the CAO was, well, it's too expensive because that parking lot is worth X number of dollars. Well, that only matters if we intend to sell the parking lot. The value of the parking lot is it, the city owns it. So the, the, the value of it, the financial, how much it would sell on the open market is purely theoretical from our point of view. Because we had no, it's not like we were going to sell it to build an IHOP. But <laughs> we were only considering parking or a bridge home. And so the, the, where I get lost is how that, mm -hmm. that has the effect, and I understand we could, 
the council's rightful place to say, no, it's not too expensive, we're gonna do it anyway, right? Like, we could have said that, that's our role as policymakers, but I, I, it's, it isn't at all transparent how those opinions get arrived at. And, we, and as policymakers, we rely on you all. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you know, again, and I, every place in my district is affordable if, if I listen to the CAO's <laughs> office. It really is. Yeah. Um, um, I, I'll give you another example. Right now at this moment, we have a navigation center. There was a vacant lot next to it. The CAO's office said, and, and I said, we should get the vacant lot as well, privately owned vacant lot. And the CAO said, well, that used to be a dry cleaner, so it'll be too expensive to clean up. That, that is exactly yeah. what, that is exactly what, it wasn't you, but yeah, was that's saying. exactly what the CAO said. Well, fast forward, we have a tiny navigation center next to a food market. People are buying food right now, every day on the site that we could have had a bigger navigation center with more parking, more offices, more services, all the rest. But, you know, when I get that information as a policymaker, you know, I mean, I suppose I could spend a day poring over numbers to see if that's the case or not, but th that isn't, I think, the most useful way for us to use our time. And so I guess I'm just pressing for, similar to Ms. Rahman, like we need to just some insights on how these opinions are arrived at, what they're based on, yeah. and do you use the same opinion-making process in every situation? Mm -hmm. That's, that's a fair question, and, and, and I'll, I'll do my best to try to answer it, and I'm sure we'll come back to this conversation again. Because every time we have a project, it has some uniqueness to it. We work with uh, Bureau of Engineering. We work with GSD on negotiation of lease rates and other costs and all those types of things coming back, depending on who's the administrator of the site, particularly some of the city-owned sites and how they were acquired or where we're getting them. We talk about sanitation and the, the reimbursement rates and what was it that it was purchased for and what kind of money and how it has to be paid. All of those things come back into every, every conversation and all of them have a little bit of uniqueness. And so when you end up doing the final total, you're like, wow, how did we, how did we get to this, to this number? But somebody along the way may have said their component was high or, or expensive. I think we can go back through and try to, to narrow down something for you, it gets it gets kind of tricky and nuanced because everybody has different aspects to a property, particularly city-owned properties, because it was they were purchased with different types of money, and some has to be repaid and some doesn't. Where you're going, though, and I appreciate, and I'm not quite answering your question, is as we start to look at more of these private sites, this this is why this is starting to become so important that we have a same way of looking at things as best we can over and over. I acknowledge there will be uniqueness and anomalies just like any affordable housing or permanent supportive housing site. But there comes a point where your bed cost comes too high or your operating cost comes so high and then you start looking at your alternate costs like, oh, you know what, we could have two of these if we just move it to someplace else. Those types of challenges come into play versus against, well, we don't have anything at all in that particular location. And I would call that the, the crazy matrix of of trying to get a deal done and get more more housing. Um, I also, I honestly, I, I hope with the beginning of expanding on this document that we get more options because more options also means better opportunities and better prices, particularly with the way the real estate market is right now and the mm -hmm. kind of edge that it's going on, that the type of conversation, which I can't elaborate what was going with the particular example you were mentioning, but um, that we have more options to have that conversation so that we don't have to this or nothing. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? That, that's the part that's very challenging. It's, sometimes it's this or nothing. And I will just add, I think part of the, you know, honestly, um, part of the challenge is, is every time we have an interim housing conversation, particularly from the CAO's office, we're trying to figure out where we're gonna find the funding. I mean, we, we just don't have the funding allocated just as we did perhaps a year ago into the council that we could actually take a look and best plan on how we, d we do it. So right now we look down to see where we can find any savings possible in order to get something done. And that makes it very challenging. So if you come in with a higher number than we could possibly find, 
you are correct. It would be deemed it's too expensive for us at this moment to, to move forward, and we literally just can't find enough sources to make something happen. That's kind of that's kind of the hard reality. And we go through a lot of conversations with a lot of folks to try to find money, even, even private sector money, if somebody wants to participate. But that is a unfortunately a very real challenge. So when I say if we come forward and money's put in place and we talk about just say fifty million dollars, then we're gonna have a quick conversation about, hey, what times what do you wanna what do you want to target? Sure. We can get the best for this or we can manage this or we can actually do some family and we move forward with there and we have a, a cost basis at one time that becomes more clear and less opaque, if you sounds, will, in a conversation. Yes, yeah, so yeah. I think it sounds like we have some questions in this conversation, so I'm going to recommend that we come back to this item with a few additional things that we'd like to request from you. One is a scoring criteria that you would be looking at in order to evaluate between different projects, including things like location, uh, how many sites are in that area, um, you know, needs, local needs. Uh, and uh, per bed costs and how you evaluate per bed costs. Um, I think I would like to also have a, just, a, a, just a deeper understanding of how this process compares to other cities that have actually generated this kind of private market mm -hmm. um, and just uh, to make sure that those are included. A recommendation on how we could do a combined RFQ, RFP process. And finally, a request to identify a source of funding for um, that we could utilize for an RFP process going forward and uh, you know an amount of that funding so I think if you could come back to this committee with that additional information I think we can move it to full council at that point okay very good okay thank you very much so we will hold this item yep for the moment and we'll hear it again when it comes back uh, as soon as you have that additional information which I hope will be timely thank yeah, you it should be. Yeah. okay let's move on to item 10, and I think you had a clarification on one of the earlier items, is that right? Yes, Madam Chair. Just for the record, uh, is it the uh, intent of the committee to note and file item number two? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Yes, that's right. Um, okay, let's move on to item 10, which is a, uh, a HACLA item, so if you wanted to. Uh, item number 10 is a verbal update from the Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles regarding progress and emergency ho housing voucher lease ups. Great. And so we've been in touch with um, HACLA regularly about this item. You've presented in front of this committee a few times about this issue, um, partly because we just wanted to make sure that we had greater visibility into the use, utilization of emergency housing vouchers and really trying to ensure that we weren't giving back unutilized voucher dollars to the federal government. I think we want to be in a position where the um, city of Los Angeles is using every dollar that's being given to it. And uh, we really wanted to work with HACLA, even though HACLA historically hasn't come very regularly in front of this committee or this body to ensure that that happened. So I'm grateful for HACLA leadership. Um, you've been very forthcoming with your numbers and very willing to come to this body and discuss with us your progress. And so I wanted to invite you back again, um, Mr. Van Natter, and, and uh, uh, if you could provide an update on where we are and what are the challenges ahead and ensuring that those dollars are utilized and how, how the city can be helpful. Very good. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to give an update on the emergency housing voucher program at HACLA. Um, you may remember that we received 3,365 emergency housing vouchers or EHVs and I'm pleased to report that as of last Friday we have leased up 2,800 of those. Great. So that is 82% of the allocation. Has been leased and up. Th that's big news for us. We're very happy with that. It's um, on a par with what's happening nationally with the emergency housing voucher program. Um, the national average is 84 percent, so we're at 82 percent. Um, we have about 565 vouchers to lease up, mm -hmm. and we are on track to do that by the end of this year. That is our goal. It's not necessarily a HUD goal. You may remember, too, that in the beginning, HUD said that you had to issue all of your EHVs by September 30th. They later modified that um, requirement that 
all vouchers that had not been previously issued or leased up uh, could go beyond that date if needed. Uh, we Sorry. don't believe we're going to need to do that. Okay. Um, so um, to date, we have issued 4,606 vouchers for the 3,365 3, that we need to lease up. So it was about 1,300 over issuance. We always need to do that because we know, unfortunately, not everyone is successful mm -hmm. in locating housing. Um, so we have about 565 to go. We have been um, recently leasing up about 50 new EHV voucher holders a week. So we are on track to lease up all of them by 1231 this year. And 1231 is the, is the deadline for lease up? No, there is no specific deadline from HUD. We can go longer than that. We could go a bit longer if needed, but um, we expect to lease up all of our emergency housing vouchers by that time. That's very exciting. It is. We're, we're very happy about that. It's taken some time to get there. You may remember that it took us a little bit to start up with staffing to get everyone in place. Yes, but I remember that. We have done that, and uh, we are working out issuing all of the vouchers we have. We don't expect to return any to HUD or to give back any money. That's, that's amazing. It is. <laughs> I, <laughs> not to be too excited about it, but we are very happy about it. <laughs> Good. That's, that's really good. I mean, this is what part of what we wanted to do was not to repeat the stories of the past um, here in, in L.A. And I'm really excited that, that, that you are so confident that we will not be doing that um, and that we will be at 100% lease up by the end of this year. Um, I know you've made this a priority because this committee has made it a priority. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that partnership and that that's progress. Yes, it is. Thank you. So we have about 850 vouchers on the street right now to lease up the balance that we need to do. Um, we have to go by the success rate that we have for the vouchers, which is around 55%. So unfortunately, only about one out of two folks that get a voucher can use it. Um, we do expect that we'll be able to use up all of them by the end of the year, as I said. And what we are doing to help make sure we get there is we have a relocation specialist, a company, a contractor that's helping our voucher holders locate units with the last bit of funds we have available for the program for that purpose. Great. Can you talk a little bit, just one, one thing, is there additional resources that you need either in terms of housing navigation resources or um, work on the client side or on the landlord side that you think would be helpful in helping us meet these goals? Well, I think we have done that with the um, hiring of the relocation specialists because they do a couple of things. They're doing landlord outreach mm -hmm. to get more landlords to want to participate in the program with us. They connect the voucher holders directly with the units. Mm -hmm. They drive people around. They, they show them listings. Um, this is what we need to do. Um, it was a function that initially was going to be taken over by or done by LASA. What we found over time was it wasn't happening, so we realized that we had some money available through the fees that we got for the program to do this. So we did hire the location specialists. They're called Trans Systems. They're working with us now to um, connect the remaining voucher holders with units so we can uh, reach the full utilization. And how many specialists do you have? They have 25 folks helping okay. in, in the contract that we have with that company. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the... Go ahead, Councilman Bloomfield. Couple, couple, couple quick questions. The, what type of housing do the people with the vouchers end up getting? Uh, renting apartments, permanent supportive housing, other forms of housing? What, what did it look like? Generally apartments and generally one bedrooms because the vast majority of people that we're helping on the emergency housing voucher program are single individuals, though we do have families, so we do have people finding two bedrooms, three bedrooms. But the majority, probably 75%, are one bedroom apartments. Could be a house, but generally apartments. And then. And then what contributed to the successful leasing? Is it, you know, what helped with the lease up? Was it the navigators that you guys had? Yes, that is helping now. We also are offering um, attractive rental amounts. Um, our voucher payment standard increased on October 1st. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the highest one we've ever had in the city. For a one bedroom, as an example, it went from 2100 or 2096 to 2400. A big jump, it was over 16%. And did you make that decision or? No, HUD allowed us to. Okay. HUD comes out with new fair market rents every year for October. Then housing authorities have the ability um, to request up to 
120% of that amount to use as a voucher payment standard. We, of course, asked ask for the max, as we always do. So we got that approved by HUD, and we go to 120% of the fair market rent, 401 bedroom, that is 2,400. So that's attractive. Beyond that, we also have implemented small area fair market rents, which we started using as of January 1st. Those also went up on October 1st, correspondingly with the increase that took place citywide, and that has been helping us through the year. That's interesting. We also have landlord incentives, where we will pay the landlord a um, signing bonus if they rent to one of the homeless folks on our EHB program, that's $2,500. And we also uh, pay for a security deposit. That's great. First and last month's rent. Interesting. So it's not just about the process. It's actually the actual substance of the voucher has changed. That made a difference. Lastly, um, I don't know if it's possible, but I'd love to get a breakdown by the 80-plus interim sites in the city. How many of these clients were issued the vouchers versus achieved lease up versus expired vouchers, and how many were granted extensions? That's possible to get that information at some point. We can look at finding that out for you, yes. Yeah, great. Because we, we generally have it by the referral source and the agency working with LASA that we got them from, and most of them have been identified as either interim housing or another type of program. Great. Thank you. All right. Any colleagues, any other comments? Waiting for the chair to come back, but uh, I don't think she had any additional comments either, so... And this is our last item, so we'll leave it open until she gets back. Unless there's anything else you want to tell us about or a song you want to sing before she gets back. <laughs> we're doing all we can to lease up this allocation by the end of the year, and we're going to do it. couldn't discriminate on form of payment. Um, have you found that that's had an effect, no effect, um, or? It has had some effect. That's a source of income ordinance that we have in the city, and it's also statewide also. Um, the blatant forms of discrimination have gone away. You don't oh, see, really? Yeah, you don't see a apartment placard saying Section 8 prohibited or um, any of that kind of thing, you don't see it on websites and in listing services anymore because that is a flagrant violation. Um, however, there are other ways that owners can um, decide not to rent to a Section 8 voucher holder, but they're supposed to consider them as they would any other private tenant. Got it. Thank you. Did, did the Section 8 go up as well? I'm sorry? Did those vouchers go up as well, correspondingly? The well, the source of income ordinance applies to any of our voucher holders. Okay. But he was asking, did the Section 8 voucher amounts go up? Yes. Payments. So the citywide ones went up on October 1st to $2,400 for one bedroom. But then the small area fair market rents went up even higher in three different tiers beyond that. And the third tier, which is the highest one, which is in the highest opportunity areas of the city. It's here, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I think it's in Council District 4. The highest, the highest rents that are They are. They're in West LA. They're in North and West San Fernando Valley. For a one-bedroom there, it's close to 3200 Now, all of these have to be supported by comparable rents. Right. So not every owner will get the maximum amount they're asking for, but many do because rents are so high in the city. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I'm delighted to end this meeting on a positive note. Um, thank you, Mr. Van Natter, for coming. And uh, do we have any other items before the committee? Uh, the desk is clear, Madam Chair. Great. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.